Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. the meeting to order. Mr. Carter, I think you have the privileges. Thank you. Join me in prayer, please. Father God, as we come before you tonight, dear Lord, we come before you within this season of grace and gratitude. Your grace and our gratitude. Father God, we're aware of how much you love us and how much you care for us and how much you care about what we do and about the needs of our people. And Father God, we just ask you to be with the deliberations of this board tonight. Keep us ever mindful of your presence, of your purpose, and your direction. We ask Father God for you to watch over and protect the people of Alamance County, North Carolina, the United States, be with our law enforcement, our EMTs, our firemen, our rescue squad, be with our employees in tough, tough jobs, dealing with tough, tough situations across the, the county and the country, dear Lord. Be with people who are less fortunate, struggling to get through. Be with the 35 that were burned out of their homes yesterday morning provide for them. We ask, Father God, that you uh, guide these deliberations and let the results be in your agreement. And we ask all this, dear Lord, in Jesus' powerful and holy name. Amen. Amen. Call me for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Subject to this board's approval, I need to add one thing under item number two uh, to our agenda, that is the recognition of a, an additional person who I'll recognize as I call them up. So, uh, do I have the board's approval? Motion to approve. Second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, thank you. Chair, Chair, I'm sorry. Do you need to take off one of the items from the agenda as well? You're exactly right. Thank you. If you go to uh, eight, Point two, that's uh, item number 3344, Alamance County Sheriff's Office <coughs> personnel request. Um, we're tabling that because of a, con uh, a contract issue um, at this point. That's, there's just a contract issue. We, we need to have our attorney review the contract before that item. That's 8-2. You need to approach. That, that's correct. I think we had uh, communication with some of your folks. We're going to have about a contract that. for the. Yes. Okay, not. Okay, right. never mind. That's yes, right. right. So I'm making a motion to table that one <laughs> item. <laughs> well, I, think, I think Terry's blood pressure just went from zero. Sheriff, <laughs> <laughs> we're not trying to cause heart attacks. <laughs> I like the way you and John are finishing up your sentences. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 8-2. Uh, I'll make a motion. We remove that. Just table it to our next meeting. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
Thank you. Um, so these two items are changed. Now, best part of the meeting. Recondition of. Mr. Johnson, are you doing that or is somebody from the school system doing that? Would you like for me to yeah. read the citation, Chair? Yes, sir. Is that okay with you, Mr. Chair? If Mr. Uh, Wilkins will come forward. This time I'll read the citation for Deputy Matthew Wilkins from Pleasant Grove Elementary School. Citation reads, to whom it may concern, I am writing you today in regards to Deputy Matthew Wilkins being selected as the classified employee of the year for Pleasant Grove Elementary School. I've had the extreme pleasure of working alongside Deputy Wilkins for two years, and he has continually demonstrated leadership in his position. Deputy Wilkins spends his days moving throughout the building and building relationships with all stakeholders including students, staff, and their families. Deputy Wilkins has also taken the lead role on the safety committee and keeps detailed records of all drills that are completed, as well as mapping out safety plans for a variety of scenarios we could be involved in. Deputy Wilkins has a unique ability to form student relationships, and he is often seen spending one-on-one -on -one time with students or seen playing a game with different classes at recess. Deputy Wilkins also serves as a check-in for students with behavior plans, and he's able to speak to those students about making good decisions throughout their day. Deputy Wilkins is a viable asset to Pleasant Grove, and not only is he deserving of being our classified employee of the year, but he is also deserving of many other accolades that may follow. His ability to think through complex situations, combined with his personality and love for students, makes him a great example for all SROs to look up to. On behalf of Daniel Watson, Principal, Pleasant Grove Elementary School. Congratulations, Deputy. in the audience. <laughs> Would you please come forward? Ms. Kelly? <laughs> I think I'm hurting cats. So. <laughs> As we all know him, has served on the planning board since 18. Well, not, <laughs> <laughs> eight years, six, years. Okay, six years. Okay, six years. Um, and after six years, you have to rotate off. Um, and so, regrettably, we're allowing him to go off the board. But because of such outstanding service and Get somebody else to take the picture. You've got to be. Scott <laughs> <laughs> was the planning director, 
and these are board members who are all standing with us. Um, but the Alamance County Planning Board hereby recognizes the service of our distinguished friend and board member, Lee Isley, for his commitment to providing prudent guidance and outstanding leadership to the Alamance County community through his work on the planning board, presented this 20th day of December, 2021. And you'll see some names on there that you recognize. Lee, congratulations. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Really Thank, you. Thank you. Very much. If you'll hold up, I'm sure. Good work. In case there's any doubt in anyone's mind, that's why you run for office. <laughs> it's certainly not the paychecks. <laughs> Um, the first speakers are those that are on topic, and Mr. Henry Vines, I think you're the man up. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Uh, my name is Henry Vines. I'm 3450 Isaac Drive in Snow Camp. First of all, I'd like to wish everybody here a Merry Christmas and a Happy and Prosperous New Year. Uh, commissioners, I wanted to talk to you a little bit tonight and ask for your support as uh, you go forward tonight uh, our uh, Jeremy is going to ask for some money to uh, do the reval this is a very important part of what we're doing <coughs> we need to get this right as a member of the Board of Equalization um, it's very important that we get this thing done right and correct so that when those folks come to me I've got the I've got the proof in my hand here that I can explain to them why this is happening so I would just I know that it's extra money but the staff is short there as well and uh, they just need that extra uh, support in doing the reval and I hope that y'all will grant this so that we can get a good and fair um, Reveal. My second thing is is on uh, the request for our employees and that's coming up tonight. Uh, commissioners, I know this is a hard subject. I know it's real hard. I know we all have listened and uh, at budget time, and I think we all heard that we thought that we had rectified the problem and that we wouldn't be back in six months asking for more money. But as you go forward, I hope that you'll take into consideration all the departments, because I think all the departments are having the same kinds of issues. And when you pick out three and the other 15 or 20 other departments, ever how many y'all got out here, uh, what kind of message are you sending to them? So as you, go through your discussions my request is don't rush it let's get it right this time so that we don't have to come back in January I mean not January June and ask for another increase let's see if we can't get this thing done right and help out all the departments that needs to be I'm certainly not one that likes to throw money uh, at a problem but Sometimes uh, uh, that's what it takes, but just take this into consideration too that we, the citizens, are being asked to pay for more. And I appreciate you giving me a chance to speak. Thank you. Thank you. We have one additional speaker, but that speaker is um, an open matter, so that'll be at the uh, latter part of the meeting. Sorry. 
Okay, Commissioner Responses. I have one for Henry Vines to ask us to increase spending is absolutely outstanding. I've never seen that in my lifetime. <laughs> Henry, we're proud of you. <laughs> Thank I you. I was thinking that, but I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're dead on the money. We need to be careful, and we need to help some people out. Thank you. Any other comments? Do we have a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Do we have a motion as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. second. Well, Mr. Turner seconding. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, you know, Alice. Let's just make sure the rest of the agenda goes out quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. At this point, we need a motion to open the public hearing for the Planning Historic Properties Commission, the West Grove Friends Meeting House. So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh-huh. Okay, we're now in the open hearing. Say good, who's presenting that? I think uh, Ms. Cattle may have some information to present about the, the nature of the marker, and what it's about. All right, good evening, commissioners. You all have a, well, quite a handful of uh, information attached to this item. Uh, to get you through it, you have first a recommendation from our Historic Properties Commission Chair uh, recommending approval by the entire board. Their meeting was October 12th. And you also have in there the recommendation from the State Historic Preservation uh, Group, and they have reviewed the entire report that you all got. They made recommendations, made some revisions were made, so they are ready to move forward with it of an approval as well. Uh, you have some plaque language as well. For what the plaque will look like should you all approve uh, from here it's it has went from staff to state review to historic properties and you all are the final decision making board after this this is actually recorded at register d should it get approved so it becomes a legal document goes to tax office for any tax exemptions that may be gotten and um, then the plaque will be placed on the actual structure uh, Ms. Hadley is here and a member of the church if you all have questions or they can speak for public hearing too. Board have any questions? No, I just like to say Ms. Hadley was my eighth grade teacher, one of my oh. favorites. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you dare answer any question that is She's also a faithful attender at the gym for uh, YMCA. And, and there's another student that was up here earlier. Rodney. Rodney. Yeah, Rodney. Feet. I happen to know that because my wife is a much more faithful than I am. Uh, so Sandy's mother. That's her. Mother was my student. My, now that was back way when I was in old secretary's. <laughs> Such a blessing, a true blessing. Amen. We expect a full report on all three. No. <laughs> Impeachment proceedings. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Motion to approve. I'll second. Well, we've got to have, a, okay. we've got to close the open meeting first. Okay. Okay, motion to close the meeting. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah, motion to approve the request. Second. Yeah, motion to second. Any, any further comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. And I'll hand this around for signatures. Mm -hmm. 
not be appropriate, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for all your support, and, and it's from the whole spirit that I've been able to work on this, and this is Louise Hobbs, who's also a member of West Grove Friends Meeting, who's here with me. Her, her father was a president of Guilford College, <laughs> Richard Hobbs, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm humble. You're a hard worker, too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to signify to whoever the last commissioner, um, I saw the red sticker I signed in that slot, so they just signed below my signature on where I signed improperly. So you've got, I signed as chairman, Mr. Carter was signed as vice chair, we have three other slots, so somebody just signed again where I should have only signed once. Okay, Mr. Baker. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm here today on behalf of the Recreation and Parks Department to seek permission to accept a donation of real property on Cane Creek Mountains. Uh, this is two parcels of land totaling about 16 acres. They are bordering the current Cane Creek Mountains natural area on the south side. Uh, these properties were acquired from private individuals by the Conservation Fund, which is one of the partners that have been working with us on this project for years. Um, they are seeking to, to donate these properties to make them part of the natural area that we added to our trail system um, over time. How much will, um, what will be the total acreage for King Creek? It's right at about a thousand acres now, so this will add 16. Um, just a little update on where we are. We've finished phase one years ago hopefully you guys have had a chance to see that and we are just on the cusp right now of, fa of beginning phase two which uh, will include a new new trailhead uh, about five six new miles of trail and hopefully an observation <laughs> tower on top of the mountain if we can figure out how to get that uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a tall tower on top of a mountain is is a challenge for us but we're working on that uh, so these pieces of property are uh, even outside of, of those two phases, so they'll be uh, down the road in probably phase three. Um, they are relatively close to uh, the property on Bass Mountain Road that, that you, you guys attended for the, the veterans facility there. Uh, so almost adjoining this facility. So these will be a good addition um, to what we have. I would, try, I would be sure to say to anybody listening, don't try to take your family to Dan up Fire Tower Road. No, no, no. We briefly, briefly considered Fire Tower Road as an entrance for the park, and uh, after the first trip, said no. That's not the best public. Entrance. Beautiful drive, but it's uh, not a car drive. Once you get there, it's if, great. If you make it, it's yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. I've got a three-quarter ton uh, diesel, and it makes it all right. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. For those in the audience and, uh, and online, there is a map that's in our packet so you can go to the agenda online and see the proposed map. And there's no county input for this, so uh, it's a, a no-brainer. That's right. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thanks, Thank you, Brian. sir. Okay. Mr. Atkins, I guess. We took two off. Reevaluation. Mr. Atkins, you're next. Just for the audience's attention, 8-2 uh, was a matter that we took off the agenda earlier prior to the meeting, or at the first of the meeting. So we're now on 8-3. Mm -hmm. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me back to speak with you some more about the, the revaluation. I've got a presentation to go over and I'm a little uh, uh, starstruck for Mr. Vines to put in a good word for me. I was not <laughs> expecting that and I do appreciate it. Um, hopefully uh, I will uh, carry on in a manner worthy. Get to the slides here. Okay. So 
You'll give them a check after the meeting, is that right? That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> so at our last meeting, we talked about uh, just general uh, status of the revaluation, and one of the concerns that came up, well, the slides, one of the concerns that came up was the amount of time that we would have to review appeals so that we'd have some expectation of what our tax base would finally be for the purpose of setting revenue neutral. And right now, with the schedule we have in place, uh, there's a three-month allowance to work through that appeals process. And with the number of appeals that I'm anticipating, that, that could be problematic. Certainly, we would not be done with appeals. What we'd be doing is taking a sampling and then assuming that we could generalize that out to the unresolved appeal. So I was asked at the last meeting to come back and uh, talk about what it would take with some additional support to try to get our uh, <coughs> time that we mail out notices to be sooner and give us more time to work through the appeals. Um, I was also asked about some software that uh, helps with that appeal process and on the back end, once we sent notices out, how can we get as many of these processed as possible? Uh, so my presentation looks at kind of all the aspects of managing the appeal process to maximize that so that we have the best uh, estimate of what our tax base will be at the time that budget is being resolved. So the company we're using right now is Vincent Valuations. Uh, we are using them for two purposes. Uh, one is for a schedule of values, which is our, our pricing guide that tells us what the market is doing. And the other is for commercial support. Uh, I approached Mr. Vincent and I said, what would it cost if we wanted to bring someone in to help us with a residential? And the cost provided was four seventy-five dollars per day. Now, I'm not particularly happy, but I'm not particularly surprised. Uh, that probably is a market rate at this point. I did talk to Mr. Vincent about the possibility of reducing that, negotiating on that. Is, is that a firm number? And he said that it was, and the reason why is that he's currently getting that from other counties. In fact, he's getting up to 650 per day from other counties. 650 is if there's travel expenses. So if they've got to stay overnight, put them up in a hotel, food allowance, things like that, then it's 650. Uh, in our case, they could commute. They're not that far away, the persons that he would assign. And so it's 475. But he said, there's just no way that I can go to the counties that are already paying me that amount and say, Alamas has this reduced amount. He said, I just can't do that. Now, given our history with Vincent Valuations, when they bid the job, their staff was the cheapest. It was the lowest. Um, the others were not even close. The total package was um, still the lowest, but wasn't as wide of a margin because Mr. Vincent himself uh, charges more. But for the staff, it was as low as you can go. And I just don't see him pricing it that low to get our business and then not being willing to uh, give us a good rate on these. So I, I do think it's market rate. If the board's interested, I can go and try to price off of some competing companies to see uh, what, what they might offer. I have reservations about that uh, because then we'd be carrying two companies simultaneously, which is a little complicated. I don't really think that they would be competitive in price, but if they were, I would be nervous. Uh, in our business, there's a wide range of skill. And one of the reasons that we chose Vincent Valuations is that they had such a good reputation. Um, if you got somebody at a sharp discount, then I'll be worried about the quality of the work. That will be a concern. So in the presentation tonight, we assume 475 per day. So where do we begin from? Well. The neighborhood review, which is the, the meat of the work of setting the values, is a year-long process, which is 48 weeks. Now, I learned in school that a year was 52 weeks, but in, in the work that I do, a year is 48 weeks, because you'll never get 52 weeks worth of work. That's not going to happen. <coughs> so out of 48 weeks, with existing staff, the most that they can do is two days per week. That allows three days per week for their routine duties that, up until now, have been five days a week. And they'll crunch those down. We'll, we'll work on our efficiencies to free up two days to be able to work on revaluations. That is as much as we can compress that schedule. So that's what we have. That means each appraiser will be able to contribute 98 days to the project. We've got 880 neighborhoods, and it takes about a day on average per neighborhood. You do some faster, some slower, but that's not a bad average. 
So if each appraiser can contribute 98 days, we need 9.2 appraisers. We have nine. So we've just got enough to finish on time. And that's why when the question was asked, can you do sooner than March 1st, the answer is not really without damaging quality because we're just very, very close to that margin. If we wanted to push it back to February 1st, now we have 44 working weeks. So at two days a week, that means that each appraiser is now only producing 88 days of work during the project. Nine appraisers gives us 792 days of work, but we need 880. So there's an 88 day shortfall. Now, if we bring in support, support can work five days a week. They don't have the routine duties that, that we have. So at five days a week, that's an 18 week period. Allow two weeks for training, we're talking about 20 weeks. And we know 20 weeks, five days a week is 100 days. We know what the charge per day. We would spend 47,500. That would be the bare minimum to bring it from March 1st to February 1st. Well, what if we wanted to push it back to January 15th, right? Now we've got 42 weeks. Each appraiser is gonna contribute 84 days. That's 756 days out of 880. That's 124 day <coughs> shortfall. At five days a week, that's 25 weeks of work. With training weeks, it's 27 weeks. We're gonna end up having to pay 135 days or $64,125. Again, that's, that's the minimum to crunch it down to January 15th. We can't really do it sooner than January 15th unless we're willing to change the structure of the work itself. And, and the reason why is if I consider every sale that occurred in the revaluation period or in the study period before January 1st, then there's a, a lag time. So a sale comes in December 31st but it's gotta be recorded. And then we've got to pick that up and process that through. Then we've got to evaluate it, do anything that we need to do, send that information to the printer and get it out in the mail. And there's just no way to, to do that if we go through the end of the year. Um, we could cut it off early. There are counties that will end before January so that they can get their notices out even sooner. The problem is until the next revaluation, Anyone that asks me, Mr. Akins, have you considered all sales? I have to say no. I have not considered all sales. That's not going to make a big difference as far as the final values. A couple of weeks of sales at the end are not going to change the world. Uh, most appeals that will never come up, but your big appeals that end up at the state, they will all ask me because they know my answer. And I would like to be able to say yes, I've considered all sales. So for that reason, the earliest I think we can do it is January 15th. Now there's some additional considerations. Um, one of the trends that, that we've seen in the last few months, counties that have been watching growth at six, seven, eight percent have projected that growth forward in the revaluation work. So the early neighborhoods that they've worked on, they've assumed that that's what they were gonna see. Well, as I presented at the last meeting by October, we were up 20% in 10 months. Now we have a problem because when you project forward, if you're off by a percent or two, you're fine. If you end up being off by 10, 15%, you're in trouble. So these other counties now have to go back and redo the early work before they can send values out. This is not something I've anticipated. Um, I, I like to think I've, I've covered every eventuality. I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I've not anticipated this. My model does not allow for us to have to go back and redo work. In the last revaluation, that was not a factor. In most revaluations, that is not a factor. It might be in this one. Whether we guess low or guess high. Let's say that we go on the high end and the market doesn't perform as, as much as we think. If it's significant, we have to go back and redo the early work. We can't turn loose the values if they're not correct. And that would cause delays. It would not cause a, a failure of the revaluation, uh, but what it would do is it would delay notices going out and reduce that time. Um, if we don't change the timetable from March 1st, then we had to redo work, it will be easy to reach April 15th before notices go out. And we turn a three month window to look at appeals into a six week window. That's real problematic. And so one of the things we need to consider is how do we avoid this problem? 
Um, another thing that is really weighing on my mind <coughs> is the idea of having contractors doing our revaluation work. Now, when I ask for Vincent to assist with schedule of values and commercial work, I have no qualms about that because that type of work is not sensitive to location in the same way. If you're reviewing a commercial value and you're looking for comparable sales, you'll reach to the whole region looking for sales. You won't stay in Alamance County. That's just the nature of, of, of that sort of property. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at your schedule of values, again, you're looking at kind of a regional data set. So those are not bothered by it, but residential, you can go two streets over and you cross an invisible line and you're in a different neighborhood. And if you're not from here, how will you know that? If you're not familiar, how will you know? And so that, that gives me a lot of reservation about um, allowing the uh, contracted workers to do that portion of the work. Um, and I'm not really following my slides at this point, but that's okay. So the, the concern I have there is I want to keep our appraisers here in-house doing the work, setting the values. How do we do that? I love cooking shows. You tell me about residential. Residentially. I love cooking shows. And you watch and you've got the, the master chef that steps out there to cook. And you notice that everything is already chopped up for them and measured out for them. The oven's preheated. When they're done, somebody does all the dishes because they have sous chefs that do all this for them. By the way, I would like a sous chef for my kitchen. <laughs> that, that, that would work out well for me. Talk to your wife. Huh? Talk to your wife. I'm her sous chef. <laughs> <laughs> this is the idea. And in talking with Mr. Vincent, he made this suggestion because he has the same concerns. He said, our, our staff are not going to have the same eye for your local residential as your staff will. So what I'd like to do is take the contract and support to do non-localized work. So I could go anywhere in the world, and if you direct me to a house, I can sketch it out and get all the information. If I'm familiar with the computer system and they're familiar with our system, I can put it in the computer system. I don't have to have local knowledge to do that. <clears throat> But now when you tell me, is this, what, what level of neighborhood was my land rate out there? I know Alamance, I don't know anywhere else in the world. So this is what we want to do with them. Have them pick up new houses, decks, storage buildings, uh, work through all that sort of thing that their expertise is well suited for. They're not making judgment calls about localities. Keep the final valuation still with our staff. They would never approve a final value our staff would go in and make all the final decisions on value, but it would all be lined up for them. And if we do that, we can change the formula from our staff doing two days a week reval to doing three days a week reval and two days on the routine duties. If I can free them up for that, I think we solve all of our problems. And this is what that would look like. So now I've got to split the team. So three of the appraisers I really can't get assistance with they have to do their own work exclusively. Six are the residentials, we can. So three are still on two days a week, six are on three days a week. The team would produce 24 days per week of work. Over a 42 week period, they would produce 1,008 days of work out of 880 days. That's 128 day surplus. That's 14 and half percent more than what's actually needed. Right. What this does is it gives us time to be able to redo neighborhoods if we need to. Now my thought process is this, we get so far into it, we realize that we're fine, our projections are good, we're not going to have to redo work, we cut them loose. There is no need to continue paying. The way we're structured with Vincent is it's on demand. At any time that we say we're done, it's over. We spend as much as we need and we stop when we're done. And that's what we do here. If we see that, that we're in a good position, we say thanks for your help, send them home. If we realize that we're going to have to redo some work, we're already ahead of schedule, this helps us to clean things up relatively quickly. Um, I would rather do it on the front end than on the back end. If we don't plan for any of this, we get into trouble, then we're trying to get them to bail us out. That's not a good scenario. I'd rather have it on the front end. So the cost of that, if we've got six appraisers and they're taking one day per week per appraiser, that's six days a week to cover. 42 weeks means that we'll have to cover 252 days at 475 a day. It's 1197. That's if they do the, the entire project. Like I say if, if things are looking good, we cut them loose early. 
we don't spend that kind of money. But we need to be prepared to spend that um, if we take this option. Another thing to look at with appeals is I think it would be good to have additional support during the appeals season. So we've been talking about the front end. How do we get notices out sooner? But it doesn't really work if the, when those notices go out, we start to, to bottleneck and we're not able to process the appeals as they come in. Really, the, the other side of the equation is how many can we flow through during the time that we have. And for that, I want 100% of my staff dedicated to working appeals. I don't want them doing any new construction. I want them to completely stop at that point and do nothing but appeals until appeals are resolved. Um, that's going to give us our best outcome. But although we can postpone a lot of things at that point, once notices go out, our deadlines are all moved back to the next year, um, we really don't want houses completed without anyone being inside of them. So we still need somebody going out. And that's where I would uh, bring in additional support. Um, for the first six weeks of appeals, I think that you could probably use two contract appraisers to, to handle keeping the routine work at bay so that our in-house appraisal staff 100% is on those appeals <coughs> processing them through. So if you have two contract appraisers at 475 a day, uh, that's 950 combined, five days a week, six weeks, that is 28.5 for six weeks, and I will be prepared for 12 weeks. I don't plan to spend this. You'll notice a theme. I don't plan to spend for this, but I will be prepared for this. The goal is not to spend all of it, but just know that it may be out there. It may be something to consider. Um, an additional factor, though, that I want to look at, too, this is what uh, Commissioner Lashley was mentioning with uh, software, is to have a better interface for our citizens to reduce the number of appeals. Um, we did a, a small version of this in the 2017 reevaluation. It's kind of an amateur project. We, we cooked it up in-house, and it, it worked fairly well. Um, I don't think it would work at scale, but it worked for what we did in 2017. Is presenting to the public a lot of information about property so that when they receive their notice, they can immediately research and say, does that seem reasonable? And what we saw in 2017 is a lot of folks that funneled into that website did not proceed to appeal because they were presented with evidence that, that this is what the market is doing, your value is fine, there's no grounds for appeal. If we can reduce unnecessary appeals, again, we're in a much better situation than if we're churning through a lot of unnecessary appeals. Because with a lot of market movement, if folks have not been actively looking to buy a home or sell their home, they may not realize just how far it's moved. Mm -hmm. So to be able to present them with good user-friendly information, then if they still feel like they have a, a need to appeal, we process them through. But a lot of those, I think, will stop at that, that step, and that will help us as well. Um, there is a, a software package that I would like to mention. It's Spatialist. Um, they have some tools that are geared towards the, the county staff. What I'm looking at are tools that are geared toward the public. Um, there are competitors to Spaceless. I'm not trying to pick one company, but they had a very convenient video to illustrate how this works. It's uh, short. It's about three minutes. And it's a lot easier to see than for me to say. This is what Buncombe County did. And Bruce, can you watch the video from there? Yeah. This one to YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's probably the blue link. Buncombe County Tax Assessment has new online tools that will make it easier for you to view your property details, compare property values, and for appealing reappraisal values. It's the property record search and comper tools. To get started, visit buncombecounty.org slash myvalue2021. On the screen, you will see a big square button that says Property Record Search Tool. Now you can search for your property either by name, address, parcel ID, or all of the above. When you find your property, there will be key information about the land, details about the building, and its transfer history with value changes. Note, Tax Assessment recommends everyone view their property to make sure the building information is accurate and up to date. 
If you look at your property's building information, you will see the number of baths, fireplaces, heating type, bedrooms, patio size, etc. If you notice anything incorrect, click on the blue See an Issue, click here and request a change button. On that page, you can change number of bedrooms, baths, fireplaces, or add any additional changes you want to make. Make sure you supply your proper email address and a phone number so tax assessment can reach out to you for further inquiries. You will also notice on the search tool that you can access Discover Buncom, which brings you to Buncom County's tool that gives property owners some very useful information about their property. It not only provides links to your property card, but you can verify your address for 911 service. You definitely want to make sure if you call 911, they will go to the correct location. You can see what the nearest parks, pools, and libraries are. You can even see your school district, voting precinct, and local representatives. And finally, you can access a crime map to see what sort of activities have been going on within your neighborhood. Back to the property record search, you can also find your billing and property card, your GIS, and easy access to appeal your property value based on the upcoming 2021 reappraisal. Finally, there's a button for the comper. Welcome to the comper. It is an easy way to identify and view comparable sales for a property. The subject property will be highlighted in red on the map. In yellow, you will see the sales that are comparable within your area. Before we get into the tools, I want to talk about how to use the map. It has standard online map functionality. You can toggle between satellite and street map view and zoom in and zoom out. Since it utilizes Google, you can also view the street imagery by dragging and dropping the Pegman on the map. Now for utilizing the tools of the comper. By default, the selected sales are within a specified distance of the subject property and are within a specified date range. A red filter indicates that it's active. You can refine the filter at the top to change the criteria of the search for properties you want to compare. For example, you can increase the search radius, search for more recent sales by adjusting the sale date range, search for sales with a specific square footage size, or search for sales that are a specific quality or grade. If your search returns too few comparable sales, you may need to relax or turn off some of the filter conditions. Note, clicking on any of the sales on the map will highlight them in the list. Clicking on a property in the list will expand the attribute information. To select a comparable sale, click on the Add Comp button. To view the selected comparable sales, click on the Comparables tab. Lastly, click on the Save Comparables icon to generate a PDF comparable sales report to save or print. There you will find an easy, organized way to compare your property with the others that you choose. For more information and for great resources, visit buncombecounty.org slash myvalue2021. By the way, if we were to do a video, we would break that up. <laughs> That's pretty intense. It sure is. Uh, but it's a nice survey of, of what that does. And the idea is, again, that if you present an easy resource for information, then citizens can quickly tell if the value that you've assigned seems reasonable or not. The, the appeals that are without uh, any, any base go away. And the appeals that have real legitimate reasons you can focus in on. And in fact, because they have feedback tools where they can say, hey, you got the wrong bedroom count. Hey, I've got this square footage. That helps to speed up the process because we spend less time wandering around and we get right to the problem. So, all right. For that, uh, the last time we had a proposal for specialists was in 2018. They quoted us 48,000 for the first year with 30,000 per year thereafter. Uh, that is obviously out of date, um, and there are competitors in the market. Spaceless is not the only company that does this. Um, if you'd like, I can get an updated quote from them. I can also solicit quotes from their competitors. Uh, right now, Spaceless is the, the leader in this space, uh, but Esri, which does our uh, GIS, uh, is uh, trying to compete with them. So I, I can't say as to who has the best deal, the best service. Uh, we can certainly look into that if you're interested. Um, and I recognize that I've kind of thrown a lot of things at you. Just to recap, the, the minimum to push back to February 1st would be 47.5. The minimum to push back to January 15th is 64,125. If we want to have an allowance to redo early work, uh, then that would be uh, up to 119.7. Again, hoping not to spend 119.7. For appeal support, Six to 12 weeks would be 28.5 up to 57,000. 
and for the citizen facing software it would be 48,000 with 30,000 recurring. Uh, and, and I really, I, I, I'm bringing all this to the board because I, I don't know the direction the board wants to take with this. I, I've, I've pulled each piece of the puzzle from let's send notices sooner to let's get more staff involved in processing appeals to let's try to weed out frivolous appeals by giving good information. Um, if, if you took all of the options, it would maximize our ability to know what our tax base is, have as many appeals settled as possible, uh, but it can be any mix and match, and it, and it can be none of the uh, none of the above. It's just trying to get a read of, of what the board's interest is, and then proceed from there. Um, did I understand you to say that you had polled or had received bids from other providers as well for the software or for the for the uh, service for the uh, appraisal support? Appraisal support. Uh, when we selected Vincent Valuations, we had uh, three bidders. We put it out and three persons right. responded. And at that time, uh, Vincent was the lowest generally, but specifically when it comes to support staff, they were much lower. I thought that's what you said. I just wanted to make sure I heard it right. Yes. Okay. Um, and you haven't gotten a bid or you haven't looked for bids on the software then that way, am I correct? Right, exactly. This is something that periodically a vendor comes by, we say, yeah, we'd love to see what you have and they'll send us a proposal but not really doing anything serious with it. So that was the, the last time was in 2018. If we had the software mm -hmm. and, we, and we upgraded it annually, <clears throat> would that make a subsequent four-year revaluation? easier to process on a more rapid basis? Absolutely. Well, and I'll tell you with uh, the product that Spaceless is using, I'm, <laughs> and I say Spaceless because I'm the most familiar, they got to the market first for tax assessment. Um, Esri, I, I think, has realized that and is trying to scramble around very quickly, so I, I'm, I'm not locked in, I'm just more familiar. They have um, additional tools that work on our end of the equation to help us to speed up our valuation process. But again, at this point, I'm limiting to just those tools that are trying to get the appeals worked down. Do you perceive that in the future, at the next four-year reval, that we would need to bring in support in addition, or would we want to look at building our team to a point, on, since we have these on a four-year basis, mm -hmm. four-year rotation? I would prefer to build the team. Um, I, I just, I'm a big proponent of, of local knowledge and local accountability. Um, the situation that we're in is that the lead time to, to get somebody ready to produce is about two years. If I bring somebody in, I uh, say off the street, we, we do try to get some, some basic qualifications. Uh, to have them ready to help us with a revaluation, it, it's two years before they've got the competence that they would need. Uh, so we'd have time between revaluations to do that. Obviously at this juncture we, we don't. What are we? Uh, what are we paying a person at that level of confidence? What is that? Uh, oh goodness! Salary range for a person like that. There, oh, I'll look over at Sherry at some point, because um, they're in the low 40s plus fringe, so in the middle 50s. Cost. Mm -hmm. Less than than what this would cost by far. How many people would you need on a, to do that on a? So uh, th there's another question which comes into play. Right now, we are reviewing one eighth of our parcels annually. Right. And this has allowed us to do the, the in-house and not have these huge swings. If we like that, if we want to continue to do the one eighth annually, then there's not really that much additional staff to bring in. Um, I would probably look for two additional persons, <coughs> and I think that we would be good to go. If we wanted to try to conform that one eighth to a one fourth to match the four year right. cycle, then we would have to have additional staff to make that happen. Uh, and, and that's it's optional. I know that the state would like for us to do that, they would prefer that. But the fact is that on an eight year minimum, they really can't complain if we're doing eight years on the one and four years on the other, it's better than eight years on both. So I don't think that they would make an issue out of it. Um, and that's, that's another thing to the board's discretion. I try to, to save costs everywhere I can. <laughs> yeah, right. this is the citizen's money and I, I want to be frugal with it. Um, but, but it is consideration. If we're talking data collecting everything, every one-fourth, 
I'd have to have more than two people. I'm fairly certain I'm not the only person with questions. So. Well, I have a couple, but I think sure. we should deal with the alligator closest to the canoe. Uh, what do you need tonight? Do you need a vote? Do no, you need a direction? Direction. No. Um, I mean, it, it seems to me that it would, it would, it would be advisable to, to move the, the completion date as, as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we know a year out whether we'll need to redo work because we don't know what the market's going to be. I sure. think we can wait to make that decision. Peel Sport, I think the answer is the same. Citizen facing software, I'm not convinced that that's going to do the trick that, sure. that we think it may. I mean, if I'm a citizen who wants to question the, the you know, the value given to my property, I'm going to want to talk to somebody. Right. Um, you know, so if you direct it, well, go, go to the website and you'll see you're wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to work. So, mm -hmm. see, I, I would support the moving, moving it up with the, to the January 15th. I think we can wait to make the rest of the decisions. Mm -hmm. I do have a question of whether is this, is this a budget item for, uh, for next year that we need to consider, or is this a budget it would item be that we would this need year. to It would have to be part of this year because we'd have to, to begin right away. To, depending on, on you know what what level we're we're talking about is, is when we have to start, but I, I would anticipate it being this year. Is that a budget amendment, Mr. City Manager, or is that? So I think uh, in speaking with Jeremy, it sounded to me like this decision would need to be made by maybe the end of February, perhaps, in mm -hmm. order to secure the help and get the company engaged to get you to hit the timeline. Mm -hmm. So if if the commissioners are interested mm -hmm. in doing this, we're going to work with Jeremy to try to figure out. Where would we take these mm -hmm. funds? Is it possible to do this now? We have a reval budget that has some money left in it. We need to get with Jeremy to make sure that uh, we understand how his spending is mm -hmm. going this year, how much of that money is going to be left. So I would I would say if we hear tonight this is something you're interested in at some level of these different options that Jeremy's given you, we're going to be working with him to come back to you, hopefully uh, the January 18th meeting perhaps, uh, or maybe 1st of February to give you this is where the money is, these are the costs, will this take a budget amendment, or have we been able to figure out how to do it uh, mm -hmm. with the dollars that exist now? Mm -hmm. So I think that your exactly. understanding. Okay. And additionally, with the digital appraisal cost mm -hmm. that you have pointed out, mm -hmm. it would be really nice to have uh, some idea of what the cost will be. Additionally, obviously, mm -hmm. we're writing a check for about close to a half million dollars a year paying back monies because we're so off mm -hmm. our appraisals right. are so low mm -hmm. and we're having to pay that back to the mm -hmm. um to the state every year right. half million dollars is a lot of money oh yeah absolutely we've got to bring our our cost and appraisals within range yeah. we pay a lot of salaries with a half million dollars right is right. a point <laughs> do a lot of rebounds <laughs> <laughs> so the <laughs> The direction of the board would be to um, look at the, the software, getting some actual live quotes on that. Um, and as far as the support, we, we've got a quote for the cost per day. It's just a matter of what we want to do. Talking about uh, January 15th, definitely for the uh, redoing work, just kind of wait and see what, what materializes. Um, and the same for the support. I mean, if it doesn't look like it's going to be as severe of a uh, season, then we'll We'll have to worry about it. If so, we'll worry about it at that time. Is that and and at this time, appeal support is in the future off of this year. This is not. This is for next year's budget anyway. I mean, just just put well, that out. As hectic as budget is, and yeah. John and I have been through more than than one. Uh, Pam and Bill and Craig have been through one so far, and uh, we all know how hectic it is. But uh, mm -hmm. we don't want to be trying to deal. I don't believe with. Um, trying to figure out what's going to be the consequence of uh, uh, appeals going on into the process and moving it right up to the deadline of trying to come up with a budget number and a tax rate for that year next year. So uh, I would really like to see it in January. I agree. January 15 would be ideal. My concern is we get in the budget process, uh, June 30 is the deadline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our last meeting would be the third Monday right. in June. Exactly. And we've got to lock in at that point. If we don't have hard numbers, yeah. that's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Agreed. Really hard to do. Yeah. I just think what Craig said about uh, software, just a reflection, Sandy can back me up on this now. Um, so many times we tell parents, just check the website. <laughs> 
people don't check the website unless they manage the website and it's so it's complicated for some people and if I'm calling about my taxes, I want a live person mm -hmm. in this country that I can understand. And that's not a throw off on anybody. That's just that just adds to frustration. So um, I just think customer service is the only way to go. And um, that looks great for Buncombe County. They seem to be the hot county of the year, and I'm happy for them. Um, but we just really need to understand that one thing about our county is we do really good customer service here and I think face-to-face -face makes a difference it sure does in teacher meetings with their students and parents so um, that's just my two cents so Pam we put you down as a vote against a Philippine call center right <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just I just like person to person I, I think we could hire the person that does returns at Walmart the day after Christmas and they could run this county so it's something to think about dealing with people because that's an extremely touchy feely thing when it comes to tax money and um, I just we just have to be just real real reaching out and doing as much as we can approachable well, to I make our county attorney happy we are an equal opportunity employer <laughs> mm -hmm. I agree Pam with one of them from the perspective of appeals on the software we have a lot of people in the county who can't even get in yeah can't get online so yeah it's a big broad maybe that'll maybe that will change between now and this point in time i'm not sure but the part i do like about the software is the fact that if this software can put us in a position so we can be better prepared to do our revaluations yeah. internally going forward then we save ourselves that other hundred and nineteen thousand yeah, dollars it's so. a double-sided coin it's you know it's just something you, and and it's going to have to be marketed you know you have to sell this to the public for them to be educated on it so they won't be so intimidated by it can i go please i wanted to wait till last because i got a lot of questions <laughs> oh, oh no but i think you're gonna be okay <laughs> Okay, um, just to let you know where I stand here, mm -hmm. I want to start as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I want you to get every single thing that you need mm -hmm. for this reevaluation. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to fight for, and I'll tell you why. Our citizens have never seen a property increase like they're about to see. Oh, gosh, yes. Never. Right. I can use the word never and be okay with that. Yes. Now, you have to make some assumptions here based solely on your worst, la your last worst reevaluation. Mm -hmm. I think we know what you're there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to think that the things that happened then are going to happen now. Mm -hmm. Double. Mm -hmm. If you don't think that double the number, you're fooling yourself and we will be in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, let me just go to a, took a couple of uh, notes when you were talking. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a great idea to use outside appraisers mm -hmm. to support our staff. Let our support, let our Alamance County mm -hmm employees lead the charge mm -hmm. and they dictate. I think that will be great for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that way we get a, get around someone from Alamance County valuing properties who are not from here. I like that idea. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess another question I wanted to ask, I'm not sure if you know this, and it's just basically to verify how, what's the population of Buncombe County? I don't know off the is top it, of my head. Is it close to Alamance? I don't know. They were they were convenient because that was actually mm -hmm. kind of the the sales link. But sure. you look at this video Buncom just did it was timely. But no, I haven't compared the I, counties. I thought they were maybe larger than us, mm -hmm. and I was hoping I that would be the are. case because then uh, when you see the software, you see the numbers of people that are trying to reach. Mm -hmm. Now, personally speaking, mm -hmm. my personal opinion, mm -hmm. I think the software is a godsend. Mm -hmm. I think the software will save our employees time and aggravation. Mm -hmm. And I know that some people may not like computers and may just want to stay away from them. I don't completely understand that mentality. But there are a lot of folks who would much rather, you know, honey, let's sit down at the computer and see what they're telling us before mm -hmm. we go down there and start talking to these folks. That's just a, mm -hmm. another thing. Now, I want to go back and say this again. I want you to have every single tool that you think you need. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why I've come to this conclusion. After talking to you and running, looking at some spreadsheets and looking at how we have paid, had to pay the Public Utilities Commission uh, $400,000 a year, mm -hmm. um, 
if you just look at that four hundred thousand dollar number, if you can just do it for the under that, I'd be fine with it. But my, you are going to reevaluate our properties and therefore put value. Everyone's going to have a real value on their property, and that's important. I believe that we have to make sure that that is done. And we're going to have to spend some money. And to be honest with you, the way I was looking at it, we're going to get 120 to $180 million to our bottom line on our balance sheet when this reevaluation is done correctly. That's straight to our balance sheet. That means that our penny per tax value is going to go up. Everything's going to be okay. So if you look at that $120 million number, and I tell, and I'm just telling you what they do on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. When if I want to try to figure out your value of your company, mm -hmm. if I can do it for one percent mm -hmm. of what value that I think I'm going to find, mm -hmm. that's a done deal. Right. Now, in this particular scenario, you're talking 1.2 to 1.8 million dollars is how much money that you would be given to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, we see we can do it for a whole lot less. Mm -hmm. So, my my question to the um, to the commissioner. I want to make sure that we give you the, all the resources that you need. I, I, and, and the last question I have is about the software. Mm -hmm. uh, the software is not the panacea, mm -hmm. right. but it's very close. Uh, when I say that, I mean uh, the software, how long will we have to use it? Will it, be, will it be with us forever, or will it only be during our reevaluation processes? And that's up to us uh, when we uh, go into the agreement with them. So, presumably, once we have it online, we just keep it online. It's cheaper to, to run it year to year than to start it back up. But we could, if we wanted to get through a crisis, put it up and take it back down. That would be an option. We'll catch you. Okay. I think you've done a great job in laying this out. Um, what the scenarios I mm -hmm. think are awesome mm -hmm. because you need to know what is, mm -hmm. and if this happens, this is going to occur. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are really important. But I, I just know that our Citizens have not experienced this, and this is not going to be easy. No matter if we hit all our targets and do everything, it's going to be difficult mm -hmm. because we realize that it's going to be a lot like what, 14 or was it? Was it 14? Oh, in the, in the 09. 07, 09, yep. Mm -hmm. That. You sure that day. We can stay away from that. If we can stay away from that scenario, and I don't think that's going to happen because we had the market rip up right in your face, right. and that's what happened. I don't think it's going to happen. Anymore. Not me after we reevaluate and say <laughs> But thank you so much for all your hard work and what you've done here. Thank you. Very much. For your comparison, uh, 2010 was 235,000 Montgomery County. Uh, 2019 was roughly 269,000. So they're growing just like we are, yeah. but they're a lot larger mm -hmm. than we are. Yeah. We got much tourism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. About a world bigger, right? <laughs> so I think what we're asking is numbers, uh, and say so is it possible to get that for our January 18 meeting? I'm, I'm, I'm certain it can be done, yes. and uh, so we'll come back on the 18th, present uh, what costs would need to come out of this current mm -hmm. year's budget, where we identify those funds, and then you can, uh, you can and make would, the decision. And we would vote on it and get you started? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm really serious. It's there. important that we start as soon as we possibly can. Because then we have some time mm -hmm. in case things don't agree with us. We have some time. And uh, I'm, I'm an options trader. I love time. <laughs> I understand. Board, anything else? We thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. <coughs> Next, we have our assistant county manager, human resources. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, so when we met on December 10th, I talked about one of our policies that we would like to make changes to in our personnel handbook and told you that I would be back with some other policies. Um, what I'm going through is in your agenda packet. I have paper copies if you want to look at those. But basically, there are um, five policies that we want to make changes to, and then there are a, a lot of policies that I want to incorporate into the handbook that are appendices right now. So the first policy is 
uh, pay rates and promotion, demotion, transfer, and reclassification. So this change is um, to be in line with how we are actually uh, working when we do this. So I'm indicating that a 4.5% increase or decrease per pay grade change would be in effect and indicates that salary changes cannot create internal inequity and address salary changes due to reclassifications. So basically what I'm saying is if an employee is promoted to a position in a higher salary grade, then that uh, person would get a 4.5% per pay grade increase with a maximum of a 20% increase. And then also what we're adding is that any promotional increase would be subject to review for internal equity and may be altered from the guideline above just to ensure that we've got the internal equity. With demotions, it would be a 4.5% per pay grade decrease, but we would not let them fall below the minimum of the new pay grade. And again, we would be looking at internal equity for that as well. Um, the third or letter C is about transfers. When someone goes from one position to another position and they're in the same pay grade, they would normally, I'm sorry. This would be across all departments, right? It so would be, yes. we wouldn't run into the same issue we ran into with some misinformation between county exactly. HR and the sheriff's department. Exactly. We hope we fix that last year earlier this yes. year. Yes, and this is keeping in line with right. what we what we did earlier in the year. Yes. Okay. Um, it, on letter C, we're talking about transfers. If they transfer to a position that's in the same pay grade, their salary would st stay the same. But again, we're going to look at um, internal equity with that as well. And then when an employee's position is reclassified to a higher grade, we're going to treat it the same as a promotion. So they would get a 4.5% per pay grade change, up to 20%, and we would look at internal equity for that as well. Do you have any questions about this, these policy changes? Yes. What does internal equity mean? It means that we're, we're going to look at all of the other people in that department in that same salary grade to make sure their salary is in line with that. We're having, we've had some issues um, in other, in some of our departments where someone, because they've been here for a long time and they've changed positions, they may get promoted to something and be way above the rest of the people in there or because they were brought in a little bit higher or just because of the timing. There were some years when we did not have um, pay increases to minimum salaries. So there are a lot of reasons why that can change and we just want to have the opportunity to look at it. We've had that happen very recently in health department. So the current language doesn't give, it just, it just says if you go up a pay grade, you get a 4.5%. And so having it in the employee's hands, this is the rule book that the employees look at, then they know that that's the, that's the guiding principle is 4.5% per pay grade. But if it's causing a, a problem, this language uh, alerts the employee to know it may not go 4.5%. It might be something different. We have that ability. So. Yeah. So you change the employee, theory. not you change that employee's pay, not the people around. Exactly, yes. we would change the employee's pay. So what we're saying is, we're not going to guarantee you that four and a half percent. That's what we would normally give, but we're going to look at everybody's pay and adjust your pay if it's if it if it causes inequity in that group. And the current language says four and a half percent per pay grade. Adding this makes it clear to everyone we are following the rules if we're adjusting due to pay inequity. So no one's uh, confused about it, I guess. When did these rules happen about equity? Because we hear that word all the time. So when did we start using equity and inequity when it comes to our folks? So really it's about making sure that you don't put someone into a position at a significantly higher pay than mm -hmm. the people that are already there because uh, the person maybe hasn't been with the county quite as long. Mm -hmm. uh, the equity has to do with the dollar amount that people are being paid. It's not uh any social level of equity it's more about just making sure uh, we try to maintain some equilibrium right when we put an employee in a new position um, i think 
this is the term that we have chosen uh, to try to describe to employees uh, why they may not get four and a half percent when they come into a new uh, a new position that moves them up a pay grade. So. But is that based on each individual's job? Because everybody's job description might be different. So, so what this is is that when an employee moves into a position where there are several people doing the exact same job, mm -hmm. that we would be looking at all of their salaries. Because if they're moving into that position and there are already people there that have been doing that job, we don't want to move them a lot higher than those people. So that's what I'm that's what we're referring to when we talk about this internal equity. So this would be you guys are all doing the same job, same job responsibilities, and we're just trying to keep some equity within that within that area. And this does not happen very often. I just want to make make you understand make you aware of that. It does not happen very often. It happens a couple of times a year maybe, but we feel like we need to have the language in here so that when we're explaining this to the employee, we've got something that says, yeah, four and a half percent is normally, but we're going to look at everybody else that's doing the same job. Well, in, in private industry, you sometimes have two people doing the same job, but one's doing a better job than the other one is, so that person may have acquired a higher level of compensation because of, because of performance evaluations. Right. And I think one of the things we ought to be trying to do too is make sure that if we have somebody doing an, an excelling in their job that we provide some way for them to get recognition. So the hope would be that if they are in, in the job, they've been getting their merits. Right. And so uh -huh. an employee that moves into the job would not move at the same, would right. not go up to the same salary, yes. yeah. And you're looking at me real hard. <laughs> I'm just thinking if Bill's been here for five years and I'm coming right out of college and start the same job, do Bill and I, do I start making what Bill makes? No. Okay. No, because hopefully Bill would have gotten some merit increases. I don't know. Highly unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's problem. Okay, I'm good. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I was saying, Pam. I want, the, I want the person that's performing in the job real well to be able to get compensated fairly, too. Mm -hmm. Any more comment? You look like you might have a comment. Just, do you need a vote from us tonight? No, okay. no. Remember, this is just we're we're putting this in front of you for informational purposes. We, we will make the changes after mm -hmm. tonight, but the board doesn't vote on these changes. But we do point back to this date mm -hmm. as the version mm -hmm. of the handbook, right? So after we leave here this evening, unless we hear something that really piques your interest and we need to talk about more, we'll implement these changes. Date the handbook 12-2021. Handbook will be redistributed to all employees, so you know, employees can go back to this meeting, watch these uh, proceedings, read the minutes, and see this is when these changes were uh, made. But it does not take a vote from the commission. And and these have all also, I'm sure I'm jumping in your stuff, or I'm sorry, it, they have been reviewed by uh, uh, the legal yes, department and our uh, personnel <coughs> team too. So. Yes. And in fact, these are these are some changes that we want to make right now. But uh, we are also having the legal team go through the entire handbook. So we'll be coming back and letting you know that there are other changes that we want to make as well. But we don't need to vote on a policy change. No. no. But we want to make sure that you're aware of policy changes. Thank you. And it alerts the employees that these have been changed. This is the date they were changed. You can go and hear about it if you want to, but this is the touchstone for the manual right? right. To, tonight. Yeah, if you totally opposed some of these changes, I think you can make that known. If we heard something that the board just absolutely wanted to talk about further, then you know, yes, we would, we would have further discussions mm -hmm. about it. But, uh, I don't, I'm just thinking. Okay, all right. I'm going to move to the next one, and the next one is very easy. This is payroll dates. Our old uh, policy said that employees once a year had to go and physically receive their check from the finance officer. We removed that because we're doing direct deposit for everybody. This was really to verify that the address we had on file for them was correct, um, but they now have the ability to go online and change addresses at any time. 
The next one is pay rates in a salary range revision. This goes back to the other. It's the same thing. If we're changing a whole class of positions, several positions, whole class, we're going to do them, uh, we're going to increase them the 4.5% per pay grade up to 20%. Um, and then we would also review for salary equity. And then if they are being reclassed to a lower pay grade, then we would not change their salaries. And this would be several employees doing the same job. And it's very rare that um, a whole class would get reclassified down to a lower pay grade. So if, if, if I go from a position to a supervisory position, that's a 4.5% increase, if it's one position? Yes. And then if I go from a supervisory position to being <coughs> a department, it's still 4.5%? Per if pay it's, grade. If it's, if so it's if one it, pay grade, right. Yes, yeah, so if it's one pay grade, it's 4.5%. If it's two, it's 9%, and mm -hmm. it keeps going. Okay. okay. Right. A maximum of 20% of what? A uh, maximum of 20% overall increase. So 4.5% per pay grade or a maximum of a 20% increase. Is 4.5% pretty standard uh, for county governments? It is. And that's how, our, um, that's how our whole pay scale is set up. Each pay grade, the, one above, the next one up right. is 4.5%. So that's how everything is set up in our pay grades or our salary scale. The next one is overtime in a declared state of emergency. So we talked about this on the 10th. Um, the proposed revisions, comp time accumulation limits were added for non-exempt employees. And then for exempt employees, comp time does not accumulate until 50 hours are worked. And then we, after our meeting on the 10th, have added that we would put a limit on the amount of hours that exempt employees could accumulate annually. And when we were talking on the 10th, there was a question about um, pay being provided, uh, uh, pay being, overtime being paid at the discretion of the county or provided as county funding is available. This slide is not, has not been updated, but in your packet it has been updated. <coughs> and it should read um, uh, overtime will be paid as deemed appropriate by the county manager. And this is similar to language for overtime not in the state of emergency. So right now, if departments uh, have the need to pay employees overtime, they coordinate that with myself and Sherry. So it's uh, they're, they're, they come to county management and say, we have a need, we've got something going on, uh, we need to start paying people overtime for a limited time mm -hmm. period. This will be the same thing for declared state of emergency. What the manager should be looking for is where would those funds come from, right? Uh, is it uh, possibly FEMA? Is it possibly uh, some other funding source that we're able to pay? This is for non-exempt only. These are our hourly employees that um, gain over time. It's important to note in this we are not uh, paying exempt employees overtime. We are giving them booked comp time that has a uh, cap. The next one is service uh, bonus program. So service award bonuses in the um, approved budget were changed from, we, we made uh, employees eligible at five years instead of seven years. And in the revision, I've removed the eligibility, eligibility requirement regarding no disciplinary action. So the policy used to say if you had a disciplinary action, you were not eligible for your service award bonus. And um, what happens is that when we have that in there, supervisors become hesitant to provide feedback to employees because they know if they give them a disciplinary notice, they are taking money away from, their, away from them. And really, this program is about years of service. Merit is about performance. This is about years of service. Um, and we just want to make sure that supervisors are giving employees feedback. And, and I believe this was this was added to this policy before we had a merit program. 
So uh, it was. we have a merit program now. Employees are evaluated through a formal process uh, through forms that are provided by HR. So. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is allow payment to those in their notice period for retirement. The way that the policy read before, it said if you've given your notice that you're going to leave employment, then you're not going to be eligible for your service bonus. For retirement, we want them to give as much notice as possible, so that's why that is going to be, um, that's why that language is changed. So we want to make sure you're going to get your bonus if you're retiring and you have given us notice. We want to make sure they give us as much notice as possible. And then the last one is just indicating that funds are paid through direct deposit. I think we used to give a manual check for service award bonuses. And then the last slide is just moving a bunch of policies that are appendices to the handbook into the handbook. And at the very bottom, it's eliminating two of the policies because those policies are covered in other places. They don't need to be individual policies. And that's all I have. <coughs> Any other questions, thoughts? I just want to say this, anytime we go in closed session, we are talking about personnel matters. And that is, we got to go to prison for it. It is that personal, you take an oath, it is not revealed. I mean, it's just what it is, and I respect that. And, and we're looking at these policies, changing these policies, and we're not going to vote on it. I just have concerns that something so important that is being changed to whatever it looks like is just being done. And maybe it's just, I'm clueless, but I know every kind of policy change that we had on the school board, and I'm sure that's just different. We had first read and second read and voting. I just think this is the very fabric of county government is your finances and how people are paid their money and how they either receive something or they don't. And, um, and I think it's great the way they are amended, they're upgraded or whatever you want to call it, revised. But um, I just think it's very important that we approve this as the governing so, Commissioner Thompson, if I, this is Deborah Bechtel. Hey, Deborah. If I may address that very good question. Counties across the state have chosen through years to do personnel two different ways. It is either done through an or a series of ordinances that are adopted by the board or it is done through policies. And so that is something certainly in the future you as a board could look at if you were interested in making them ordinances, and there are pros and cons to both. If they are ordinances, then you are voting on them. If they are policies, then historically, the board has chosen to give the HR department the ability to make those policy changes as needed. But the HR director, assistant manager here, wanted to make sure you were aware of those. So that those are just two different ways. Again, not saying one's better than the other, but that's what you have right now, and that's okay. the way it is. That's fine. Structure. Just from previous experience, that's that's just where I'm coming from because I think they're great. I just um, and I would I would say right. to uh, commissioners that you know we. We want to make sure if we're going to change this, we bring it here in the public. Employees can hear it. You can hear it. You get to see the language that we're going to change it to. And if you've got concerns or issues, we'll, we'll, we can talk about parts of this. But uh, again, I feel like, and, and I know Sherry agrees, that uh, having something as a touchstone for when the change happened and what was the change is very important. So employees know the rules. They can see them, and uh, we're all on the same page. We always know the current version of the handbook. So, and Ms. Bechtel, additionally, uh, at this point, if we have a major problem with one of these policy changes, it's our ability to make that known to the administration, and uh, and we can address that. Is that correct? Certainly. So I'm good. It's okay. just past experience because I know our names are on the lawsuits. Right. That's all I'm saying. And I just always want everybody to be in the right place and be protected. That's I all. guess my question would be, do you have a, a problem with any of these? No, things? absolutely not. I think right. they're excellent. It's just, that's just, I always need to voice my concerns. Thank you. Any other comments? We thank, thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. Jerry. 
Okay, Mr. Hagan. Well, thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman and hold, Commissioners. Hold on one second. Yeah, right. I think we've got a request of a, let's say, a 10 minute break. Sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, next item on your agenda is to continue our discussion from our work session back on December the 10th about uh, workforce compensation for county government. If you recall, back in our work session, we did a PowerPoint for the board, uh, talked about the impact um, COVID and the pandemic and uh, all the uh, heightened level of service employees have been under for the past uh, year to 18 months. And really, the majority of that discussion at the work session and uh, the PowerPoint that I presented focused on specific needs of three of uh, county departments, the detention office, uh, Department of Social Services, and EMS, our emergency medical service group, uh, particularly focused on the, uh, the difficulties those three departments are having in recruiting and retaining employees. Um, uh, you know, detention uh, salaries uh, contribute to the fact, and the nature of the work is contributing to the fact that it's difficult to get people to break into that career field and then to stay. Uh, same is the case with the Department of Social Services. Uh, Department of Social Services at the time, I believe, had close to 60 uh, vacancies, which is a significant number of vacancies uh, at the department. And then the final group that we discussed was um, uh, the uh, EMS, which we had taken some actions back August, September to do shift incentives, uh, to pay people to pick up extra shifts, and that has helped, but that is not really a sustainable model uh, for us to, to plan on how to attract and recruit people to come to, e, uh, to EMS. So uh, at, at that point, I introduced the commissioners to plans that have been put together by the three departments. They each had come up with their own proposals that they felt like would be effective, uh, that were uh, varying uh, uses of salary increases, uh, stipends for shift employees, uh, as well as a flat across the board dollar amount salary increase at DSS. Since that time, the commissioners uh, have uh, had various discussions with me and, and our uh, finance and budget staff, and we've provided the commissioners with some varying models of uh, what compensation might look like for these three departments that include uh, some different levels of percent increases that would be across the board for departments as well as specific dollar amounts that could be implemented to try to help the departments uh, recruit and retain employees and hybrid models that are a combination of percentage increases as well as um, dollar amounts and salary. So you, you have all that information tonight. We have uh, Adrian Day, Director of the Department of Social Services, and Ray Vipperman, Director of the uh, Alamance County EMS, and of course we have the Sheriff with us here this evening too that can speak to any of your questions about uh, what their departments are facing, and I hope that the information that we've provided you has helped you think about what what steps might be appropriate uh, at this point to take. So um, I would say that it's pretty uncommon for me to come as manager to the commissioners and ask for uh, consideration of action like this to address our salaries. We usually don't do that. We don't like to do that during the middle of the fiscal year. Um, we did do some of that last uh, last year, but it was due to the fact that we had pretty much reduced all of our salary increases out in uh, expecting significant financial impact because of the pandemic, which did not pan out. And the board at the time brought back the merit pay um, last year. But this year, uh, these three have put particular departments seem to be at a crisis point, uh, detention DSS and EMS, and it seems uh, my duty to bring this to your attention and to bring you some possible solutions and try to answer questions that you have and make sure you have access to the department. So at this point, uh, you have you have everything that I know. Uh, you have different models, different different costs. Uh, that is one thing you know we've tried to make clear to the commissioners. To keep you have to keep in mind anything any actions that you take that uh, affect. Uh, employees salary in these three departments we'll have to give consideration to for next fiscal year also so we've tried to provide you with with that information too so at this point commissioners uh, I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions and I know the department heads so, and the sheriff uh, will be also happy to do I'm so. I'm going to start on this end and recognize Mr. Turner. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you very much. Just kidding. Um, no, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking you seriously. <laughs> He's got too much lard in him. <laughs> um, I'd like to start with uh, with EMS. 
right now we're paying essentially overtime. Is that right for for people to take extra shifts because we don't have sufficient coverage for the shifts that we work? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, so we came in. I, I believe it was August. Uh, you know. Mr. Vipperman let me know that we were at a point where we were parking multiple trucks a day, which means we don't have staff to run trucks, which is a bad place to be. I mean, that is one thing I think has always been a standing deal between myself and Ray Vipperman is that we do not park trucks unless uh, it's just a disaster. And so w once that began, Ray let me know, and uh, we came to the board and said we have got to put something in place to get these ambulances rolling, right, and get them back on the road. So we put a shift incentive policy in place to pay people extra money to take extra shifts. Um, how much have we paid for, with that program? In the uh, last, when was it implemented and how much have we paid in overtime alone? I believe it actually began in September and uh, over uh, to the end of November we paid $111,900. At the time, I believe I'd estimated it would cost approximately $170,000 to get us through the end of the calendar year. So we're, we're on track for that, uh, for that spend. So about three months, $111,000 in overtime? Yes, sir. So about you know about two twenty five or so for for the six months that we're considering for this fisc fiscal year that we're currently in. Yes, sir. Right. Um, and I believe Mr. Vipperman would attest that it has been effective. Yes. And again, we consider that a temporary solution, but it, but it, but it is uh, getting trucks back on the street. All right. So that was something that we tried that, that has worked, but it's costing us over time. Um, what about the things that we've tried that haven't worked? The um, We've tried incentive pay or bonus uh, pay for uh, some DSS workers. Is that right? Yes, sir. That is correct. Uh, it, I don't remember the month now off the top of my head. It's been a little while back that we implemented a bonus program at DSS that targeted the five high turnover positions in August also. Um, so uh, we had a sign-on bonus that we came to the board and discussed, and uh, the sign-on bonus was for the five high turnover, uh, highest turnover positions at DSS, and the way they were to work would be uh, a total of $2,000 in a sign-on bonus that would be paid in two installments of $1,000 each, and I believe they would have like uh, a six month, you had to get off probation, and then after six months after the completion, after probation, you got a thousand dollar bonus, and then the next six months you had a, uh, you were eligible for a thousand dollar bonus. We also did a referral bonus, uh, one that would uh, a county employee that referred someone to DSS uh, who was hired and remains employed for a period of six months. That employee making the referral could receive five hundred dollars. How many people have we hired into that program? Checking with HR uh, earlier today uh, indicated that we had not paid out any of the sign sign on bonuses. I'm not aware of any of the referral bonuses then that have been paid. So we only have two um, people who are eligible for the uh, referral bonuses, but those employees haven't been with us six months yet, so we haven't paid any of them out yet. Okay. Have we lost people despite the uh, retention bonus? Yes, we have. How many have we lost? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that number. And, and that, Commissioner Turner, that was the third leg of this bonus program. We did a retention bonus for the remainder of DSS staff. That was a one-time bonus for uh, all employees. The sign-on bonus was only for the five high turnover. So the retention bonus was for any employee who had been with us at least one year. That's correct, yes. Um, another question is, so I, I approach this from the private sector, and, and if this is primarily at, at DSS, a question for DSS. When I'm... When I'm trying to fill a hard to fill position, I target that position. I put money at that position. I try to recruit people for that position. Can can you tell me again why why we shouldn't do that for DSS? So for, so, com, so for us, compression is an issue. So if we um, continue to target those five um, high turnover position, right. then those workers will make more than their supervisors. Well, what if you include the supervisors in those divisions that are short? That's right. And so then those supervisors will make more than their program managers. And then if you look at compression across the board, those supervisors who are their peers, right. who've been there longer, then those supervisors, those five high turnover positions, will make significantly more than those who have been there. Um, compression is a big issue, um, and it's not just DSS. Uh, you know, it's, What's, it's, it's the 4.5 percent ladder that we talked about earlier today is sort of affecting that, isn't it? So, 
So historically with DSS, we've not always gone up 4.5 for every pay grade. Okay. And so now. So it's, it's uh, worse. It's a worse problem. Right. And, and so listening now, so when, if we take employees up four and a half, um, <clears throat> one, I don't think we'll be able to do that because the workers who are in those positions right now haven't had those significant raises. And so it may be difficult right. to be able to do that. And I think this speaks to the change in the right. policy where we're now able to have um, give some consideration to that problem. And at least the employee can see written in the handbook that is possible. I may get the pay grade uh, promotion, but not be able to get uh, the, the four and a half percent increase if it starts causing right. uh, a disaster at the uh, department level. I don't want to yield the floor, but Mr. Carter had a question that's related okay. to that. Well, earlier this year, we had a problem in, in, uh, in the sheriff's office staff with our sergeants and above who it, due to some miscommunication of several, several years ago had not been receiving increases like they should have been as at the promotion times. And so we found lap salaries and used that money to bring those officers or officers up to up to where they needed to be salary wise for, for every from what I understand everybody from that from sergeant level and above. Is that a situation, are there, with all the vacancies we have at DSS, are there lapsed salaries that possibly are sufficient to address that kind of an issue for DSS? I mean, we can't, if, if every time we do something we're creating another problem, that's just not going to work. Um, we've got to come up with a solution that actually works. And if, you know, if the, if we're going to spend all this time, we spent a whole day working on this the other day, and I'm not trying to make that a big deal because you guys work a whole lot harder than we do. But if we're going to spend a lot of the county's effort and time addressing this issue, let's get it fixed right instead of letting it get fixed wrong. So I, I, I will say I think uh, it's, it's an important point to, to make uh, mm -hmm. is that in all of the scenarios that the commissioners have been provided, the Department of Social Services and Detention have enough either lap salary or lap spending and salary this fiscal year, this fiscal year, the remainder of 21-22 to afford it. It does have impact next fiscal year. We've tried to provide that for you. So if you make that decision to use for DSS and, uh, uh, and detention their lap salary or lap spending, you, you have got at least an idea of what you might be looking at having to commit to in, uh, in the following year. EMS is a little bit different. Uh, we've looked at EMS's budget, the, the scenarios that we've put together. Uh, the department's budget as funded currently would not have uh, enough funding to support it. Uh, we do believe and we know that every year we do have funding left on the table somewhere uh, throughout county government. So it could be that at the end of the year when we're doing budget adjustments, we always come back to the commissioners to say we need to do budget amendments, that that might be the opportunity if, if it came to that, we would be uh, putting funding in DSS, I mean, excuse me, EMS's budget from some other other pre-approved budgeted source to make that work. Well, do we know if we have available funds and lap salaries in DSS where we could look at doing something like that? We do for we do for this year in any of the models that have been given to the commissioner. So the, the, the models that you're looking at, I think I'm speaking correctly, uh, we've estimated that DSS has enough lap salary to make them work, but that's this fiscal year. That, that is not going forward. So. Well, if we fill the positions, hopefully we won't have that problem, but that's a good, not a good problem really to have, but we can't have people working the kind of schedules your people are supposedly working and doing a stellar job at the same time. Well, can I ask one other question? Yeah. Um, Mr. Pepperman. Yesterday morning, we had a tragic occurrence in Alamance County. 35 people were put out of their homes. By the way, in case anybody needs to know, First Baptist Church in Graham is going to be collecting clothing and other things that might be beneficial for their for those folks. But 35 people were put out of their homes. Praise the Lord, nobody was killed and nobody was seriously hurt from what I've heard. But... 35 people at one time in a fire, if there'd been serious burns, smoke inhalation issues, um, things of that nature. What kind of stress would that have put on EMS to get those people to the appropriate hospital? And how many people would we, I mean, if we had 15 of those people, just 15 to 35, 
which is would have been entirely possible if somebody hadn't been alert and caught that issue at, I think, John said, uh, 4.30 in the morning, something like that. Somebody saw it and alerted them. But 15 people had, would have had to have been transported at one time. We've got 11 ambulances, right? So anything else going on in the county would have been shut down or we'd have been bringing in people from other counties. Yes, sir, that's correct. So at that moment, we would have eight ambulances on the road because that's what that's our 24-hour staff and it's eight. And then we had some convalescent trucks in the peak time during a traditionally busier hours. Uh, so what we would do in that situation is we would, the first unit on scene and the supervisor would begin to triage patients. And so we would determine what acuity patients were and we would start grouping them and we would use our ambulances that were available to transport the, the patients that were most critical to the hospital first. And we would be relying on out-of-county resources to come in to transport some of the less critical patients that could perhaps be managed on scene for a little bit longer uh, until we got everybody transported. But, you know, sometimes we would have eight available ambulance and sometimes we might have one available ambulance. You know, it just depends on how that falls with, with given call volume right here. Do so we have a working agreement with adjoining counties, do right. we not? Yes, sir, we do. We do. They'll, uh, you know, when we run out of ambulances, they'll come in and cover for us. When they run out of ambulances, we'll go in and cover for them. And so we have a good working relationship with all of our surrounding counties. But if you've got all of our assets in East Alamance County, and I'm in West Alamance County, <laughs> and I'm having a heart attack, then I'm getting service from Guilford County. And not quick. Yeah, at times. And it, it can create some issues. We've got to take care of our people. I mean, not only are we dealing with issues that affect our citizens, but we're, our employees, but we're dealing with issues that affect our citizens. Well, I think EMS has done a really good job to make a priority of making sure the units that we have are staff and rolling. Right. So it, that, that's been one of the, the department's priorities. So it's, uh, you know, again, that's why the shift incentive was very helpful. Uh, it just is, it's not really, it's sustainable and uh, not the longer term solution. I want to be absolutely clear that I'm not criticizing the folks that are doing the job. Absolutely. I'm saying we've got to make sure we're taking care of you guys that are taking care of us. The last question I have is related to detention. Ms. Sheriff, we've got uh, a request for 4000 for uh, salary and 4000 for stipend for the platoon workers working 12-hour shifts. What, what is the, what's the rationale for that number, for that total 8000 number? That, right now we're so far behind surrounding counties where we've lost people too. It's unbelievable. The, the rationale for the 12-hour shifts is those people have to work 12 hours. They don't leave that jail the stipend and then the four thousand dollars will be raised across the board to be able to up our people sir for the uh, uh, 47 positions people will be coming wanting to go to work we had one guy that left and he's waiting to see what happens here to see if he comes back shift uh, work you want in? a shift 12-hour shift work yes sir okay. thank you and you know i just like to say this we had a mini riot this morning between a Latino gang and African American gang in our jail. We hardly had enough people to deal with it. And uh, I, once again, I want y'all to think about the liability y'all put me in and I put you in for not making you aware of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Corn. Um, well, I, I can say the same thing for the sheriff's office. I mean, we've. Uh, We've had uh, two detention officers assaulted recently. Um, We've had actually, three, including the lieutenant that came to the aid of one of the detention officers, right? You went in? Wasn't it three when the lieutenant that came to the aid of one of the detention officers? We've had 15 assaults, two very, very uh, serious assaults. I just mean the ones recently, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, one of our lieutenants probably going to have a back operation that we won't have to pay for. It had to jump in when our female detention officer got assaulted. Um, I just, uh, we, we've got to take care of these people. We've got to, we can't let our, we can't let our uh, employees not have the right support in doing their jobs. Ms. Thompson? Thanks, Skip. 
That's okay. Ladies first. No, well, I'd have done, done it then. Go ahead. Well, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> got a lot of notes here. Uh, DSS. Uh, board, this board tried to, to help and it didn't work. So we have to do something else. That we do know. Uh, EMS. I think the only issue that I have with EMS, with the, what you're asking for, let me just make sure the county manager has the right numbers for us to ask for it. Uh, Mr. Hagan, I just want to make sure that you're saying that for EMS compensation plan, we will have to increase $300,000 right now to take care of them for the balance of this year. You could either increase them now or wait till the end of the fiscal year, and we're coming with uh, but three, budget amendments. 300 k is the right number? Yes, okay. that's our estimate. Uh, and I see that this implies that the 22-23 budget will be increased for EMS for 600000 That's correct. So I want to make sure you got the numbers right. Yes, okay. sir. Let me ask you a couple of questions about the uh, funding for EMS. This, uh, the 300000 is what I want to focus on right now. Uh, can can we use ARP funds to fund them now? And uh, my second question is, can we use that money to fund them next year, the 600 k number? Yes. Now, I do realize that the $600,000 number is going into my budget as an addition. So yeah. I will have to make, make that okay two years from now. I'm saying for the next 18 months, give, give a EMS all the money from ARP funds. And then realize that the commissioners were going to have to come up with 600 k going forward. Because we know this money is going to run out at some point. And to be honest with you, I'd really like to try to use it the whole entire time because $600,000 is... And, and, compared to what we have is not a lot and can be done. Yes. So I just want to make sure that can be done and then just knowing that if we could use ARP funds for the total 900000 300 this year, total 600 next year, and just the commissioners realize that we got $600,000 600, added to our budget for 23-24, yes. which is going to be a I wish you are going to be here. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> It's going to be 23, 24. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be got and ARP <laughs> and lots of lots of things converging on one, one and point. And the school, yes, coming yeah, on. Yes, line. yes, that is It'll true. It'll be fun. So we might have to call you back in. <laughs> <laughs> We've laid the groundwork as best we could. I think, uh, <laughs> I think you, the uh, school operating budget. It's it, uh, yeah. did we uh, incorporate? I can't remember in the capital plan. Did we? Uh, well, I'm asking questions off the script, so I'll, I I'll think stop. Small print <laughs> his his contract that says no. he can be reactivated. Well, you know, I'll goes like in the ring. Right. He can't go nowhere if he's got two broken legs. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> tough to stay I'm, at the podium. I'm I'm to, kidding. I'll have to lower the podium. Or in jail. I think the yeah. sheriff is. Yes, he's made that picked clear. up right there. I think one last time. One last thing, uh, and I'll let Pam. Sorry, take your time. Take your time. Um, I just want to talk to the sheriff. Uh, I understand completely your issues, uh, completely. And after sitting down with you and your, your guys and your, you got my full support. Thank Whatever you, you need, and the reason I say that to you, Terry, excuse me, uh, Sheriff Johnson, is um, I am confident that we can do these two things with DMS. I'm confident with EMS as well. I'm just trying to figure out a new funding source to expand our resources. But I actually do believe that what you've asked for, we have the money to do it. Uh, Mr. Haygood can back me up on here. We have $3.8 million that we have left over that we haven't spent in the last nine months, we could use that money. So the money's there. And I just want you to know that the money's there to take care of it. And I think that all three individual folks, we have the money to take care of it through next year as well. So I think what we should need to do is take care of you folks for the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. And let's see if we can get some get some headway on these 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 salaries and these positions that we need to let's let's get aggressive. Let's Let's maybe work with the county and see if we can get another avenue to out there to, to, to uh, advertise these jobs. But I'm in full support of this. And I just think that uh, EMS, we can help you guys too. And uh, EMS, the only thing I really want you to be aware of, and I'm sure you are, you work in this industry. What I hear in the community is EMS is a vital, vital service to our, to our community. 
big time. Everybody realizes it. But as the board realizes, at the end of the year, we have folks who call you to need help and for some reason don't want to pay for your services. And that is what sometimes, as a manager, sort of gets you in the end, is when you think that we do the right things for you and we give you all the tools that you need, and then at the end of the year, we can't get other folks to hold up their end of the bargain. So we want to let you know that we understand that's, a, that's an issue and uh, how, how difficult it is to get funding for your operations and then not get paid for your operations. So I understand how difficult that is, but we will work, work with you to get this done. Thank you. Okay. Um, huh. I've just have, I watch the news a lot. I talk to the TV a lot, and I see all these smash and grabs, and I see all these um, random shootings, and I see all kind of stuff where cities are on fire, and I don't believe we've had a smash and grab here or our city's been on fire, thank the good Lord for Alamance County. I see where sometimes people call 911 and they're put on hold and they're said, um, we will have to get back to you. Huh. That's the reality of some things. Um, we recently had a massive, massive mother of all drug bust. I went out to Lake McIntosh to met some pretty awesome uh, law enforcement, SBI and all kind of stuff and it was a huge number of people which there's no telling how many were not caught behind all that huge number of people. Kind of like child abuse. One case you catch, there's four that's worse and you haven't found them yet. We recently had a loaded pistol to go to one of our high schools that could have put us on the news recently like so many other shootings that we see and praise God for a brave mother that did the right thing concerning her child. Um, we recently had the murder of two women and caught the guy um, going headed down south and caught him because of good detective work and uh, collaboration with other counties as well. We have problems here just like everybody else, but we don't have problems like everybody else. Um, Caswell County's EMS is higher on the payroll than us, and they only got one high school, one middle school, and four elementary, so that tells me their population is a lot less than ours, which means probably they don't have as many calls as we do, and thank goodness they make what they do. Um, I don't think you can ever pay a first responder enough because I saw the news. I saw Tony from the health department sitting there waiting to help somebody with their medication. I saw DSS people and heard about them that I'm in their board meetings once a month. And I, and I, I see EMS there. I see fire there. Fire from volunteer fire departments all over this county manning up, doing what they always do, showing up and really willing to save lives, plus our, our cities. Um, if it's one thing it's showed us, thank you to the good Lord, and I'm just so thankful nobody was hurt, but displaced people in a, in a county that's hard to find housing, if you're not displaced, it's, it's a very difficult time, and DSS will find that somehow. Um, they have showed us just exactly what they do. We have seen a lot of big things on the news. Kentucky, how no matter how flat in that area look, there's ambulances, there's fire trucks, there's the city with all their bulldozers always showing up and that's what you can always say about first responders they always show up during COVID all of us are at home hiding scared to death and they have to go out and always show up um, I'm in that jail a lot and that jail can never be short because everybody in that jail is not happy about being in that jail and that can make them very dangerous not just to detention but to each other and there is no way that we can have a low amount of detention officers in that jail and think that's okay. And if we don't have a strong government that is supported by leaders who want to take care of their government employees, for some reason these are not hobbies. These are the people we always call first, no matter what, and they're always there. But if we don't have a strong government, we're going to be the people on the news that they're wanting to send the wrong people in to take care of emergencies, or you're not there, or you just see all kind of mayhem and chaos. And I'm not going to sit here and be a county commissioner or just be a citizen of this county and be out of fear that somebody's not going to show up when I call because other counties are more attracted to them because of their salary. It took us a long time to get the supplement for teachers in the top 10. We're above Guilford County. It makes a difference. And the thing of it is, it's not really about the county government. It's about folks who work here just like everybody else works at their job and they work at their job to make a good living. 
This is just a whole different type of person that always puts their self last and puts us first. So I don't know why I said this last time, we have got to do the right thing by the very people who keep us safe and always put us first, no matter what that role is. And if we can't do that as elected people that have been elected to govern this county and make sure the foundation of our government in this county is as strong as anybody else on the map, then we're not doing our job. And I think what these folks need, they come in, it's Band-Aid, Band-Aid, Band-Aid. That's all we ever hear. Bonus, bonus, bonus. I remember the $1,500 stimulus package. I would love to know how many people still have that. I do. Don't, well, you would. <laughs> but, I mean, that went out the thing because some people have never seen that kind of money. And that's a blessing. But I'm just saying, you know, we're all four, five so different, and everybody has gifts. And, and I'm just... I'm, I'm just about doing the right thing based on principle. And I think it is time that the very folks that keep us safe are paid a good salary so we will quit losing them to other counties. We don't train people to go save lives in other counties. People are here to save ours. And if we matter, then they are supposed to matter. So um, I, just, I just think we need to do whatever it takes to let our county folks that work at that jail, that drive that ambulance, that carry that weapon, that go out in the middle of the night, DSS, in one of the most horrendous situations, that we respect them and we appreciate how they respect us enough to take care of us. Um, because um, there's just no question about this. And I, you know, this fire has really hopefully showed a lot of people I saw some really ugly comments about folks that live there, but if you have an ugly comment about those folks, just be thankful that you're not in that situation and that you have a home and you're not a transient person just trying to make it from week to week. So um, I just hope we will do the right thing as leaders who were elected to lead this county to make sure that our government and the very people that keep us safe are taken good care of because they sure take good care of us. Well, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Pam and Bill and I are all Baptist. So can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> can Presbyterians say amen? <laughs> okay, I get the last shot, I hope. So, <laughs> one, Mr. Sheriff, if you have to give up your federal contracts, what's that going to cost us? Anywhere from four to six million every year. So approximately five, six million per year. Yes, sir. How many salaries can we afford to pay commissioners with a six million dollar potential loss? And that's a lot well, of money. Well, not with a loss, but with, if, if we keep it, we can. <laughs> yeah, if we keep, but to do that, we've got to get your numbers back up, do we not? I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't have a choice if we don't do something. I'm gonna have to give up the contract. So I we've got to get the numbers elevated back to where they should have been all along. Yes, sir. All right. Six million dollars. One one single department. Um, I really appreciate everything that all three of you, the groups, social services, EMT, detention, uh, really appreciate it. I think we as a board are showing that we support you. Now we need to step up to the plate and do it. Do we have a motion, board? So moved. Give me numbers. What is your motion? Okay, now you're gonna make me think here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, commissioners, if I can, I'm, I'm happy to refresh the board on the original proposals from the department. It, sure. Uh, okay. Refresh. So I was gonna go get them, but sure. Okay. Uh, so the the Department of Social Services has proposed a plan: five thousand dollars salary increases for all employees effective date January first, twenty twenty two, uh, with those costs to be paid from the department's existing budget for fiscal year twenty one twenty two. And that's for which department? That is the Department of Social Services. Thank you. The detention uh, office has proposed a plan of $4,000 salary increase for all employees at detention and a $4,000 shift stipend for all shift workers. These are the platoon folks. Uh, this would be effective uh, January 1st, 2022, with the fiscal year 21-22 cost to be paid from detention's existing budget. And we did assume an incremental hiring rate based on uh, what the detention believes this will do for their department. Um, and again, as like DSS, we, uh, those funds would be paid from the department's existing budgets. EMS has uh, proposed a 9% salary increase for all employees, effective uh, 
at the department effective January 1st, 2022. Uh, these costs would need to be funded from an outside source. ARP funding is, uh, as Commissioner Lashley mentioned, would be a potential consideration for that um, uh, funding. So that's that. those are the original plans as per put forward by the three departments. Yeah, I guess the only thing uh, motion I would try to do is to, if the board likes this idea of trying to get EMS's funds all through ARP. That's would not would save our taxpayers some money for at least 18 months, um, and then we wouldn't have to budget the 600,000 until 23, 24. Uh, basically, what I'm thinking about doing here is solving these issues for these three departments for 18 months. But I'm not in any way <laughs> don't think that this is not going to cause a ripple effect with our employees. This is going to be another meeting that we have in January. To uh, and I'm just thinking of uh, the Parks and Recs. I know they just lost yeah. some folks. Yeah, um, that's true. And you know the only reason I'm even going down this road and adding Parks and Recs to this idea is the 3.8 million dollars. I always knew that that money was there, and I wanted to hold on to it as long as possible. And I think I've done that. Nine months is a long time when you're working in government to hold on to money. But knowing that these three departments have had these issues and we have this money just sitting there, it's been sitting there for nine months, let's use it. Let's use it. Let's solve these problems. But the only thing I would ask these department heads to do for me, and if, if you're able to get this money, I really want you to keep us updated on a monthly basis. I'll probably be calling you. How many people will be hired? What's it look like? How's the marketplace out there? And you know, you can call me every day if you want to. Well, <laughs> as part I of your motion, would you consider a once a month report from those three departments? I would love to, just to keep us up to date, just to make sure that. Well, except for the sheriff, favorite. where it'll be daily. Keep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can just have breakfast every day. <laughs> That's good money. But my motion is, uh, I'd like to use DSS and the sheriff's funds through our regular funding process, but I would like to uh, go uh, use the ARP funds for the DSS. That's my only difference. You mean EMS? EMS, excuse me. Excuse me, EMS. I'll second you, Mason. That's your first motion. I'll yes, yes ma'am. But that's going to work. The only, with DSS, we paid signing bonuses and recruitment bonuses and all kinds. I would recommend that we terminate that at this point with yeah. these increases. Yeah, well, we know that doesn't work. Would you add that to your motion? Yes, sir. That's fine. No. Second, the ditto. Thank you, just said, yeah. So we have a motion. Just, just, uh, just repeat that, please. Yeah. Right. Oh, my ask amendment was that with DSS we had a uh, sign-on bonuses, we had referral bonuses. I'm, I'm recommending we terminate those at this point. Anybody that's earned it or is earning it would continue, but from this point forward, that would not continue with a referral bonus and that sort of thing as part of your motion. And I think you indicated you would amend your motion to include that. Yes, sir. And Ms. Thompson, I understand yeah. you amended Absolutely, your John. second. Absolutely. All right. Colleagues, I would recommend a little caution here. Um, I, I fully recognize that these departments are in crisis and that there are essential functions of county government that are in danger of not being performed. I recognize that. And I recognize we have to take action and we have to do it tonight. I recognize that. Um, but this, that's a, it's a $1.4 million increase to this year's budget at the numbers that are being asked and it's a $2.5 million increase to the, the demands of county government for next year. Um, the point of a, of a budget is that you consider all of the needs of county government <coughs> and that you rank, rank, you rack and stack them and you put it all together in one proposal that the commissioners vote on. Um, this is a snapshot. This is a, a one-time thing where we're considering three departments. Um, we're not considering them in context. We're not considering how does this affect, I mean, there are, there are requests for capital, there are requests for operations for the new uh, diversion center request for for teachers requ I mean there are so many requests and there will be requests from additional departments as Mr. Vaughn stated and Mr. Lastly alluded to additional departments that are going that this will create an expectation for significant increases and I'm not saying that's wrong 
What I'm saying is we should have a little bit more caution. What I would propose is a measured approach. What I propose is that we, that we would increase for each of these departments a 6% increase, which is an increase, a higher increase than um, any of the departments that this board's ever approved. 6% increase across the board with the exception of the shift workers at detention, which I think would give a B4 and 4 that the sheriff has asked for because of the, of the serious nature of the deficiencies there. And that in 90 days we'd evaluate to see how that's working. Are we getting people in at the, at the rate that we want or are we not? And evaluate at that point, at the 90 day period. And at that 90 day period, it's three months before we actually approve a new budget. Uh, and you could take all of these things into account. I think you would do, need to do um, a, a study to determine how much each department needs in terms of its salary. We've got what seems to me to be a broken system in how we, how we allocate pay to our, to our employees. We've got the 4% ladder with some, with some departments. We've got a different ladder with other departments that take into account other items that other departments don't take into account. There's a mix match. We've got more compression at DSS than we have at other departments. It's a mix match of policies because it, I don't think it's had a long, serious review in a while. So I would think at the 90-day period, you would take a long look and, do a, and, and add all this information to come up with, at budget time, the appropriate pay not just for these three departments but also the entire county. I recommend caution. That's my recommendation. I would vote against the current proposal. I do have a question for you, Commissioner Turner. Uh, you said that you wanted to make this uh, increase uh, six percent across all. I'm three, sorry, across just the three. Across all three. Okay. All three, with the exception of the shift workers, twelve uh, the twelve hour shift workers at detention, which are in severe severe uh, uh, shortage. Well, I guess the only question I would have for you. Well, I got two questions. If we if we were to get to that 6% number, if we were to do your 6% number, we are still going to be looking at an increased budget next year for these three departments. Yeah, it, it may is. not be as big as we are looking at on paper, but the 6%, because I initially looked at it that way too, and this is how I looked at it. Take the number 6% and give them 3% a year for three years. Yeah. Because it's just a stair step, but to try to, try to help my taxpayers at the back end. <clears throat> Uh, but then when you look at it, it's like, you know, uh, the money's there. That's the only reason I'm, I, I see what you're saying. The 6% number looks looks good. And but I'm just saying it's like, it, it's just going to be, in my personal opinion, I think it'll be a short-term fix until the next budget cycle. And that's when we're going to have to eat our Wheaties, is the next budget oh, cycle. Yeah. cycle. Because uh, mm -hmm. I'll just tell you my thought process, and you tell me where I'm wrong. Uh, Mr. Haygood, our budget's $185 million this year, right? Yes, sir. If you just take the rate of inflation, 6.8, we'll round it to 7 to make math easy. We're going to add four, basically 14, uh, uh, let's see, 7% at 185 million is about $12 million. So you're basically looking at your budget being $197 million next year. Uh, regardless of anything comes into the fund balance or anything extra, that's what we can pretty much bank on. Now what I did is I took the $2.5 million and subtracted it from the $12 million number. So to let me know, that going forward for the next six months, I can't go over nine million bucks. No matter how bad I want something, can't go over it. And that's why I'm thinking if we can, if we if we do this, there is enough money in the budget for next cycle to do it, and there will be more money in the next budget cycle the way you want to do it, because we're just giving them less up front, and then let them come to us next year with their budget request. That's how I initially thought I was going to do it as well. Um, give them what they need this year and just ask the sheriff to sharpen his pencil and come back next year with the, 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 num the numbers that he needs to stay within his budget for a whole entire year. Well, Commissioners, we have a motion on the deck right now. Commissioner we Turner, what do, you, what do you think about that? What do you think about the motion? Well, again, I, I think that hasn't changed my view that a more, a more measured approach in the middle of a budget cycle is advisable. And if we, if we get to 90 days, maybe maybe we look at it at 60 days. But if, if we make this move and then we evaluate, and if we need to make a, move, a bigger move, we do. If we don't, 
then we then we put everything in context in budget season and look at all county employees all county positions well I don't know if you can look at every single county position but a study a serious study and and this is sure, Ms. Hook this is why I frowned at this 4.5% 4, 4 is because I, <coughs> I I'm not sure that that's sufficient I think we need to maybe bring some some private uh, the private sector thinking in this and, and maybe we need to look at whether a 4.5% 4, 4 ladder is appropriate. That's why I didn't, I didn't I, I frowned at that. And I think that's part of a study, a part of a deep study. And, I'm, and I, I am told that, that uh, an, employee, an employee salary study is, is a, a sensitive topic in the county uh, for, for county employees because of the things in the past. I, I, I can't, I understand that. Um, but I think we get serious about that. And we look at maybe if, if we bring in some private sector thinking, do we, do we have an opportunity to, to start to take some employees from Guilford County, from Durham County? If we just think a little bit differently and that we're not always in lockstep. Uh, and I think if, if we take a more measured approach right now, it gives us the opportunity to do some more creative things later, which we may not have the opportunity to do if we have such a huge move right now. I, we are in crisis, we have to act, but I think a more measured approach is valuable. Well, from a historical perspective, one of the reasons there's a problem with salary studies is when we've done them, we've paid money for them, and then we haven't followed them. So I, I think it's kind of ludicrous to spend the money and then not follow it. Now, that's what's gotten us in the position we're in right now. So, uh, that really hurts trust between your leaders oh, and your exactly, county employees. Exactly. It would me if I was a county employee. Um, and and you know, I asked um, Mr. Aiken a question. Um, Y'all all saw the answer to it, I believe, in our in, in, in his answer. Uh, I was looking at the at the numbers of our tax base, and it's it's up over five hundred million dollars. That's looking at the seventeen. The 2017 revaluation, our tax base in Alamance County this year over last year has increased over <laughs> $500 million. Now that equates at 66 cents to approximately $3.4 million in additional revenue we should receive next year. So. On that's top. before the revaluation. On top of that's what right. we should that's get on from top the of what we've saved, that's on top. This, this decision would be from, much, much clearer uh -huh. if our audit had come through. Yeah, somewhere in there, I hope we can give some, some benefit to our taxpayers. But we've got, you know, our taxpayers don't want to be on the, on the wrong end of somebody getting, mm -hmm. God forbid, killed in, in the detention center, either a detainee or a detention officer. Um, not having enough staff in EMS, not having enough staff in DSS to take care of the case flow, which is, I can't even, having some insight into that, I can't even imagine what that must be like. Um, you just know when I come on the board last year after being one on this, DSS was short around 40. Now they're over 60. Just yeah. same with attention officers, same with EMS mm -hmm. and, and parks and recs. They just lost two or three to the state of North Carolina. And if you, Parks and Recs is a big money maker and it's a great draw to the people that in live in this county. And we're supposed to take care of the things that we have if we're going to have them. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest we take this vote. We need a second. One. We already have a second. We have no, a motion and a second on the deck right now. Uh, and we've got to address that at this point. The only additional comment I would make is we, we can't lose a $6 million contract because we're fooling around today. We need to take this move. We need to do it now. We are going to have to do our, our, complete our budget before June 30th of next of, this, of 2022. We can address all the full county before that time, that is during that budget. And that's just right around the corner, guys. Uh, and I included females and guys. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, I call the question. All in favor of this motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Passes four to one. Thank you. Thank you.
And you know, I'm just going to say this because I'm thinking it. I want the taxpayers of Alamance County to know that this is not going to raise your taxes not one penny. I would not be voting for this if it was not that case. And if I thought it was close, I would bring the numbers and I'd make a presentation to you. Amen. Once the Alamance County taxpayers does not going to raise your taxes next year. Not going to, not on my watch. I'm hoping we can decrease the tax rate. Let Bill get in your books. We'll see. We'll show you something. <laughs> okay. Thank you, DSS, EMT, DEMTION. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Budget amendment, DSS low income housing. Um, please present. Thank you. I am. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Candace Goble, and first I'd like to say thank you for the kind words tonight. Um, they mean a lot to me, and I know to all of our staff at DSS. Um, I'm here tonight representing DSS um, for the requesting of two budget amendments. The first one is the LIWAP program, which is the low income household water assistance program. It is temporary. It is based off of the ARPA funds that were sent to the state and they developed this program. So it is at this particular time, just a one time program that they are offering. Um, DSS has been notified that the allocation is for $286,497. They also included some additional administrative funds that we would receive in the amount of $51,114. Um, there is no county match for this. The total of this budget amendment is $338,593, and we are requesting that these accounts be established tonight. Excuse me, just to keep the record straight, okay. and I do wear hearing aids, so I could have misheard you, but I thought I heard you say 51114, and it's 52114. Yeah. That's correct. At least that's in yeah. our documentation. That is right. 52114. Okay. My apologies. My notes are different than what that's I think. okay. Up. I'm so very sorry. I'm being critical. just wanted to make sure. Absolutely. 52114. And that is for the administrative funds for the delivery of the services. So that makes it 296. Wait a minute. No, you're total 338. Sorry, 338. Five, I saw the 336. 338. Five, gotcha. They teach math. So right. They do, and we are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> We know how to hunt too. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a motion? So move. Second. A motion to second. Any further comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Then the second budget amendment is for the community response program. These funds are used to further the work by DSS to fill a gap in the continuum of child mouth treatment prevention. So this program reaches out to the families who have been reported to DSS, but the cases were not substantiated for abuse, neglect, or dependency. This service is completely voluntary. The amount of funding is $100,000. Um, it is for one year. There is no county match that is required for this. Motion to approve. Second. In discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I refuse to mispronounce your name. <laughs> Tony, if you would uh, announce yourself, please. Fair enough. Tony Lugidice, Health Director, Good evening, Commissioners. Before you is a budget amendment for the amount of $343,209. This is uh, federal money that's passed through the state immunization branch to the local health department uh, for the COVID-19 vaccination effort. So we basically use it to help staff our clinics, particular clinical staff for the vaccines. Happy to answer any questions. And there's no county match. Move to approve. Second. We have two seconds. <laughs> okay. I defer. Uh, Mr. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Mr. Carter has a second. Um, any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. Can, can I ask him a quick question? Oh, sure. Just because he's, he's our sure. health director. And we're really proud to have him here in Alamance County. Uh, what do you think about this new variant that's going on, this Omicron stuff? I mean, uh, I mean, I heard, I've heard. I have a lot of friends in New York City, and they're saying that you know folks who had been vaccinated are getting sick now. Yeah. So, from my understanding, so it's it's here. It's in North Carolina. It's been in our surrounding counties. I haven't been advised if it's in Alamance County already, but I wouldn't be surprised that it, if, if 
it, it already is. I, I feel, probably feel safe. It's probably already in Alamance County. Um, from my understanding of it, um, it's it's causing it's highly contagious, but causing mild illness, and that's probably the latest and greatest they have on it as they continue to study it and see its uh, effect and impact. And it's not surprising, um, you know, va vaccines aren't 100 percent effective, but the idea behind the vaccines is really to prevent people from having severe uh, effects of illness and keep them out of the hospitals. And, and um, to date, from my understanding from the current studies, that, that our vaccines are currently to, able to hold and keep people from severe illness from, from this current virus. If these numbers right. tick up and I'm looking, I'm seeing that they think it's going to be a, a, a slow ebb in the next two weeks down. Mm -hmm. If it's not that way in, in two weeks, will you come give us a report? I'm happy to give a report any time. Just, so you know, we'll just see how this thing goes. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I figure in a month it should have run its course sure. if it's going to. Yeah, actually, January 28th, uh, 18th, I'm sorry, on the 18th. Well, the symptoms I hear are uh, muscle aches and pains and tired. Kind of like some of our employees working hard, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Thank I do you. appreciate your help. Thank you. Okay, we have one public speaker, uh, James Walker. Appreciate you hanging in there. Yeah, y'all <laughs> from the whole farm, eh? <laughs> but but well, I ain't going no salary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is my sixth time I've been here. <laughs> All right. And, uh, I was invited down to Mr. Hills, me and Mr. over here, can't think of that, Walker, <laughs> or know him, been to Walker too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we had a computer talk down there and with the state and him, and I've been retired from the state 30 years. Uh, I suggested them to sign over 40 and 85 out here right up there they write everything else up there but they don't write what needs to be up here all the time neither so right up there there is a law that there will be a thousand dollar fine if you caught litter on 40 and 85. good stuff do you all agree with that yes sir yeah y'all think y'all could get that Talking about all the dot signs yes sir Unfortunately, we don't control that. We don't we control that. Uh, the the DOT does, so. They do. We do not. Yeah. In that meeting, he said we're going to go back and see if he can do that. You think you can handle that? I can handle all I want. The DOT has to <laughs> All right. You know that. You work for them. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, and, uh, and I was talking to uh, Mr. Johnson here, and I wanted to suggest there put a law on when you come through there with a pickup, pile bags up is up on top to the cab and all hanging off the side and one strap on it. And you correct me if I'm wrong. There's a law against for that. Ain't it? So they can give them tickets too. And. Uh, so, and maybe you want to consider maybe putting in the newspaper, Alamance News, everybody in Alamance County looks at Alamance News and really how what's going on. <laughs> and uh, the uh, Daily Times News in Burlington, there will be a start and be a charge for living. Could y'all handle that? Oh yeah, okay. we can get something. That's that's all I got to say. I guess the only thing I can say, I mean, I don't want to interrupt your time, but the sheriff, if you find someone littering, you write them a ticket, right? That's the procedure? Well, Mr. Scott back here paid me a visit this morning to see how thing was doing. And the sheriff had people down there uh, at the landfill already this week. The highway patrol had weight men down there. For oh, four really? hours. Wow. Charged them eight thousand dollars for overloaded trucks in four hours. Because mm. I rode down there. And I rode all around Alamance County and the lower end of the county. And we're working on the sign system 
put it up, but they're putting the signs in the wrong place. They need to have it on the other end of the roads. So when they go out, you know, don't put it on the end where there ain't no houses, put it on the end <laughs> where the houses is at. And, you know, you're going to have to catch them to do that. But anyway, as soon as Mr. Scott left, I said, I'm going to pick up the trash down there. Luckily, I found two names. So they got a rude awakening from the sheriff's department. <laughs> We thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, so that's all I have to say. Maybe if y'all could get it in the newspaper, that it will be enforced. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Bukowski. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they go get read down, man. It's news. <laughs> Captain Gaither loves trash. Hey, I know what y'all feel about the raises. I work for the state, and this is the first year that the state employees has got a raise in eight years. Yeah. So I know what you're going through. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you. <coughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Okay, commissioners, comments as to the speaker. There are none. Do we have? Do we need a resolution for a rec for request to the Department of Transportation for a change to their uh, language on the signage over the interstate? It would be fine to have that, or just a letter signed off by the five of y'all, however you want to handle that. Ms. Hager, can you take care of that? Sure. I think Bruce has made some connections with DOT, so. We had a Zoom call with the new DOT representative, and we talked about the little hanging fruit, and he took that back under advisement to see if they could, when they're not using Silver Alert or for traffic, when it's yeah. passive, that it could be used. He yeah, said, of course, he couldn't make that decision until he went back to his patrol. We're also, uh, we're getting a, we're going to go out with, um, Mr. Walker at some point soon with our GPS to try to find, you know, he has some distinct places where he thinks they need to put signs and they're going to get back to us and with how many signs they were, the state will be able to give us and, you know, take it under advisement where they can place it. And obviously he knows the spots better than anybody living on that street uh, where it could be. So we're going to actually get the exact location, make a GIS map and get, get the, get it to the state. Um, we're going to have another meeting sometime after the new year to kind of get, but I will follow up with, see where they are with the, the signs overhead and uh, continue to move forward. I know we're not moving as fast as, as we and everybody would like, but we're, we're doing the best we can. You know, DOT short people on staff, this new budget helped them a little bit. They, they talked about that and the sheriff's been short on people too, but you know, we're doing everything we can to kind of uh, facilitate that. Uh, we've, we've increased more stuff on our web pages. DOT pointed out a bunch of sources that they have as well. Um, but they also said their crews that normally go out when you call and complain because it was our state, state DOT roads, they, they haven't filled those positions either. So it's a tough time. You know, we do ask Allen's County citizens, you know, keep our wonderful county beautiful. It's the best county in the state. So, Mr. Walker, we appreciate your help. Mr. Morowski with the. Uh Really, the only oh, local paper we have. We appreciate your help. <laughs> hey, Bruce, I guys have a quick question. Uh, should we, as a board, uh, maybe reach out to our North Carolina state representatives in 63 and 64? I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll find out from him what his answer was. If, if we're at an impasse, then that, that might okay. be the next step. Thank you. Be glad to yeah. I got one question. Yes. Amy Galley, she, I've got to give it to her. Okay. She got our raise okay. with the governor with, with the Department of Transportation. So if I need to call her again, I got her number. Perfect. If I need to reach out to her for anything, I can. Excellent. Next is the uh, county manager's report. We're going to skip over temporarily the attorney's report and move that down the page. So, Mr. Haygood? Uh, all I would say, commissioners, is uh, thank you to all the emergency response uh, groups that responded to the fire at Embers Motor Lodge. I know we had uh, municipal departments, as has been mentioned, volunteer fire departments. We also had Elmas County Emergency Management, EMS, Fire Marshal's Office, uh, DSS Health, 
lots and lots and lots of county employees uh, even uh, finance and purchasing coming in to make sure that uh, 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 we could work with the departments to get uh, funding flowing so you know, a lot of people behind the scenes and uh, thank the good lord no one was hurt and appreciate all the efforts from all the agencies involved in that that's all i wanted to take the opportunity to say mr chairman thank you the next would be commissioner's comments okay. um, i have one we have just published and we went online thursday with our new um, commissioner's assignments and so forth they have been modified and so um, our county clerk will modify that on the uh, website and so forth. But there were a, a couple of changes, actually three, I guess, uh, that we made to that list. So that'll be public information, I assume, tomorrow. Is that correct? All right. Uh, and all the commissioners have copies of their uh, older and, old and or new assignments. Mm -hmm. Any other Commissioner, comment. I have one comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Haygood, um, just want to return really quickly to the um, to the employee retention conversation that we had. Certainly, salaries are an important part of retention and recruiting, but there are also other things that that employers can do to retain and recruit employees. And I wonder if uh, I think it would be helpful for me and probably the board if the departments DSS, retention, EMS were to to provide us things other than salary that they think may be, that they might need to help with retention and recruiting? Is there anything they need from the county? Is there anything they might need from the state? What do they need other than salaries to help recruit and retain employees? And then let's let's think about how we can make those things happen. Maybe they can brainstorm, uh, you know, with, with employees there. You guys can, maybe let staff talk about that too. I think that might be helpful. Sure. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll reach out to department heads and get that conversation started. Okay. Any other commissioner comments? I do. Yes, sir. I, didn't want to, I think I've talked too much today. Um, I want to ask one question. How's the audit? I'm going to ask you every time. I know. You don't have to say it. No, I'll be glad to. Um, same status. We are still waiting on the final ruling for our interim. Okay. Um, we have reached out to the state treasurer's office. Um, Alamance County is not the only county or municipality that is waiting on that final interim ruling for them us to finalize that compliance supplement and then file our audit with the with the state treasurer's office. Okay. So there's no no end in sight. We're still looking 60 days out minimal. Hurts. Any indication as to when that ruling will come down? No, sir. Right. Let me wake up, Joe Biden. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Last uh, thing I want to ask. Uh, I think we know the status of uh, the county attorney. Uh, looking for that. Deborah, would you want to step in? Yeah, sure. So the um, ad closed to accept applications last Wednesday. Um, Sherry and I have gone through all the applications. I'm very pleased um, with the quality of many of them. There were there were a few that were um, very eager to work for Alamance County, but don't have a law degree, and that's pretty critical to the county attorney <laughs> position. So, um, but we're working on getting interviews set up uh, with different group of panels. Candidates will be meeting with managers, department heads, a couple of commissioners, uh, so we can try and, you know, refine that. Uh, and the other commissioners, of course, will be involved. And and hopefully in the next few months, we'll have a new county attorney for you. Excellent. Just want to see what that process was for, for the public. Um, of course. Thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, last question I have is the worst question I have. How's the county manager situation looking at? So for that particular uh, position, uh, we are working on putting together a brochure. I've been very fortunate to have um, employees who are excellent photographers and great historians because we want to put uh, all the great things about Alamance first forward to attract the best candidates we can. Um, I anticipate having a draft of that to all of you the first week of January for your reaction and we'll tweak it as you want to 
and then we hope to get that out on the streets, so to speak, in the proper areas that we would advertise for a North Carolina County manager the second week of January. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate You're welcome. the update. Also, I appreciate Brian Baker, who is present. I know that part of his photographs are going into this brochure and so forth, and I'm sure other county employees are also providing photographs and updates and, and assisting with that. Um, but I also want to say we are extremely happy with the re representation that we have currently. Uh, wish we could keep you got talk you guys into a permanent situation, but but I think we've already I talked about tried. that. <laughs> well, we we appreciate that so so very much. I truly do. Um, it's it's just been wonderful working with all of you. But as I've said before, my my family is all here, and uh, I I would as much as I love all of you, I would really really miss them. <laughs> you you might want to define here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, in, in Catawba County. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want anybody calling in and saying, look, she's already here. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> okay. The next item on our agenda is a county attorney's report. Deborah? Sure. So, and, of course, I've, I've shared with you the things I, I would have shared. And in addition, uh, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143, 318.11A3, I'd ask the board to move into closed session to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body and to discuss 21 CVS 710 NAACP, the Alamance County, and 20 CVD 1309, Alamance County v. Warwick. I do not anticipate any public action following closed session tonight. That's county versus who? We're asking for a repeat of the case name, please. Second case name. The second case name, Deborah. One more time. Alamance County v. Warwick. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly. I so, so move. Second. A motion second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, we're back in session. Do we have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? Everybody in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link Link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.